What's up, Instagram, and what's up, everybody watching on other platforms after the fact? And you know, shout out to everybody watching live on Instagram. Um, it's been a while. It's been a few weeks. I um, it's been a there was a two week gap in between fight cards for beefy boys, and then I did my past couple of dreadful talks on Facebook Live actually, and that was cool. Just kind of you know a little trial and error, a little kind of compare and contrast. Um, got some pretty good feedback off Facebook. So you know, any beefy boys fans out there that that are friends with me or Harrison on Facebook, we may um do. Um, a beefy boys off Facebook live one of these days. So I was pretty happy with my feedback I got from that. But um, we are back on IG at Dreadful Talk Dom and at Harrison underscore Madden. And we're here for Beefy Boys episode 34. And my beefy boys watching, let's get him on here with us. Oh man, my man is rated out with the beanie on, looking like a beefy ice cube right now. What is up? <laughs> Not much, man. I just, you know, Chiefs playing some game today uh, that I hope they lose by a hundred. So I thought I had to wear the Raiders gear to prove that. Yeah, I think I think it's it is Super Bowl Sunday, so I know everybody. If you're watching this on YouTube or an audio, listening on an audio platform, it won't be Super Bowl Sunday. But live currently while we're recording this, it's Super Bowl Sunday. So yeah, we may. Here a little Super Bowl talk sprinkled in, but what we're really here to do is give you a fucking break from Super Bowl talk because we any sports fan has been pounded over the head with the same redundant, you know, kind of irrelevant facts and bullshit for a week straight. And dude, you know, Su Super Bowl Media Week is one of those things where like I can't watch Sports Center because it's the same shit or it's really stupid stuff for a week. I just can't do it. And, you know, when I was younger, you know, I kind of thought it was fun or neat or cool or whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, you're right. I, I can't do it anymore. It's it really – it's kind of a bummer because there's, like, NBA going on. There's, you know, Dude, UFC yeah. going on. Like, there's stuff we can talk about. Like, it's not like we need filler. But uh, and, I feel you, bro. Uh, and the game only happens for four hours from, like, 5 to 5.30 to 9.30. Like, past that, uh, that's not – you know what I mean? Like, we should be pay giving attention to these live sports that are happening and not the buildup to what's going to have to happen regardless. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I am looking – like, it, it should be a good game. You know, I think we're both Team Tampa Bay, as you said. Um, yes, but sir. we're going to talk fights. We're going to talk UFC. This is BB Boys episode 34, that Ricky Williams episode. And um, Good call. Good call. Oh, yeah, man. And then um, UFC Vegas 18 slash fight night over in Volkov. Like three <laughs> different, like, naming systems going on right now. So, however you need to keep track of it at home. We're talking about last night's fights. And, and, and man – did we get both quantity and quality last night? Dude, excellent fights. <clears throat> yeah, and honestly, there were supposed to be 13 until Askar Askar wasn't cleared to even fight. So, really, we had 13 make it to fight day, which they've been doing this, like, 15 stack cards, knowing that three or four are going to fall out with COVID yeah. injuries. Kind of smart on their smart. side. Yep. Now, whenever it hits they have to run all 15, they are going to be pressed for time. Because some there were a lot of decisions last night, good fights mostly. But those decisions always push the envelope as far as their TV windows, I'm sure. Well, and they got their balls pulled out of the fire as far as scheduling goes by the two sub 30-second KOs. I know it. I know yeah. it, which, which just for anyone up. watching, if you haven't watched last night's co-main event, you could, you could leave for a minute and come back, and it, you just need to see that clip because it is yeah. astounding. I mean, honestly, anybody that's probably – any MMA fan that's scrolled through Twitter or Instagram in the past, you know, 12 hours, and had you, it's almost impossible to not come across a clip of it. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know what? That's, I, that's one thing that I, I, we haven't touched on, but it's like the beauty of MMA in today's world is highlights and, and like flash KOs, things like that, are perfect for Twitter, Instagram, perfect. Facebook. Perfect. Whereas football, you know, you can't do it like that. The game is no. 60 minutes. With, with the exception of, like, a Hail Mary or, like, a last-minute pick six, you can't really sum up a football game in one highlight. Or, and right. as cool as basketball dunks are, half the time the best basketball highlight comes from the losing team or the guy with the best stat line. Comes, so I feel you. It's really hard to summarize these other sports. And, and in some UFC fights are like that, you know, a long, complicated brawl where each guys are taking different rounds. That can't be summed up in a highlight either. But every once in a while, you get them Joaquin Buckley – them multiple Corey Sanhagen moments, and, we the, and, and uh, and it just you like you said, tailor made for this microwave generation, instant satisfaction, viral social media, all of that, like the perfect storm. It really is a lot of fun. Um, and man, you know, I didn't realize last night 
really before the fight got pulled. Like, I was bummed the Askar Askarov fight got pulled. But then when, after I was breaking down, like, the upper echelon of the flyweights, that um, – it bummed me out even more because he was – he's ranked three right now, and that would have really cleared some things up. Oh, no, no, no. Check this out. The guy that's supposed to fight last night is Askar Askar. Askar oh. Askarov is number – like, okay. but bro, those yeah, names, like, how are they going to get – how are they going like, to guys with identical names? Me? Yeah, I was like, it's I was like crazy. how did that get past me that the third ring guy got pulled from the car? So cool, I wasn't tripping at first. I thought no, I yeah, was, okay, yeah, because that was my original instinct. And then looking back, I was doing like the flyweight rankings, and I was like, wait a minute. But thanks for clarifying <laughs> that. Thanks for clarifying. I was that. so confused because this whole week I thought it was Askar Askarov, and I was going to bet against Stamen, and I saw the odds that were like minus four fifty, and I was like, how is that possible? And then I realized like, oh, there's this guy's missing two letters on the exact same name. Okay, that'd, be like, all right, that'd be like John Johnson fighting John Johns. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. That's, that's, that's impossible to do. No, definitely, definitely. Easy enough to get confused. So if we weren't the only ones confused. And, you know, we better stop saying Askar Askarov in general. I feel like we're going to conjure up some kind of spirit. Um, <laughs> yeah, no but, joke. But, but, man, let's dive into these prelims. Start it off with an absolute bang. Pure and, heat. Um, Pure heat. Yeah, man. And, and you know, what? I want I want you to introduce a lot of these fights, um, just because I think I have a lot of the wrong odds written down. I was writing down the UFC.com odds, and they were off on almost every fight. And sometimes I got to update them, but sometimes I didn't. So I want to introduce perfect. this first fight for us, brother. Yeah, I'd like to know the difference on the odds too. So at, at 145, uh, men's featherweight, we got Oday Osborne, Jamaican sensation, which I love that nickname, uh, minus 210 versus Jerome Rivera at plus 180. Okay, so I had those ones right. I had those ones right. Um, yeah, both both these guys are contender series guys. Now, oddly enough, both last fought at 135. Um, yeah. Rivera went up in weight because he felt like the cut was too much for him. Whereas, oddly enough, Osborne wants to go to 25 and weighed in a pound and a – two and a half pounds under the limit last night. Yeah, that's uh, fun. That's a it, lot of fun. Yeah, amazing because he wants to essentially go down 19 pounds where he was last night. And I thought he looked great last night. Oh, he looked great last night. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure he didn't even cut last night or he barely nope. did. Probably jumped some rope or something. But, but yeah, didn't even have to put himself through a cut. He said he came in. And, and you'll see people coming in underweight at the bigger divisions. But Joaquin it's rare Buckley, to see, good example. Yeah, exactly. But it's rare to see people come in underweight at, at fucking featherweight. But when you, whenever you figure out that um, he has aspirations of moving all the way down two weight classes to flyweight, 125, that um, it makes a lot more sense. Um, and yeah, man, as far as getting into the fight, there's not too much to get into because <laughs> it was an instant flash KO. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, one second faster than Corey Sanhagen, which spoiler alert, but like I said, unless oh, you live yeah. under a rock, you've um, you've seen that already. But uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's actually one second faster than Sanhagen. So I thought that was interesting to note. But we start out with an instant flash KO. It was it was kind of reminded me of the Buckley one, but just a punch, not a kick. Right, um, yeah. Essentially yeah. shoulder rolls and catches the dude's foot on his shoulder, which yep. that's an impressive technique in and of its own. Yeah. And, but and then, I'll be real. Watching it live, it kind of just like, I, I, at least to my, I won't speak for everybody, but for me watching it live, it kind of just seemed like almost like a fluky or he got caught up or tangled up. I, but then I, thought Rivera, talk, I thought Rivera threw a bad kick, honestly, like at first. But yeah, then you hear O'Day break it down. And you're like, oh, he made him do that's that. That's a technique. Yeah, that, and that made it so much more impressive to me. Like I said, I don't come in here claiming to know every little nuance of mixed martial arts. And I learn every, every single fight I watch. And that's something I learned last night. That's a really cool technique that he implemented textbook to perfection. Um, but yeah, he gets the, the kick kind of intentionally hung up on his shoulder, or however you want to describe that. And then um, just come straight down the fucking pipe. With That's, a, that straight left, left was so mean. So mean, man. When you think about it, it's the same way as kind of uh, Buckley where he throws yeah. the guy's leg off so that it pulls Rivera's head back up and then he just meets him with a left right in the middle. And yeah, whoo, man. And it's cool, line. too, because when your opponent's on one foot, they're obviously, you know, off balance. So they're easier to knock over. It's a great strategy. You know, I love when you guys can execute it to that that high level. Um and, yeah, man, Osborne looked explosive. It, it took a couple more, a little flurry of punches. To, it wasn't like a – I said flash KO. He was still conscious, but a couple finishing blows, and it was over with, you know, before it even got started. Oh, yeah, Rivera. I mean, he was awake on the ground after he hit the left, but, dude, Osborne hit him with, like, three very clean shots so on the ground. So fast. Like, and they were all on point on his face, too. And I was like, ooh, the I'm, I'm glad Tonyoni stepped in when he did because that would have got bad. 
That finishing flurry literally looked mechanical, and I don't mean stiff mechanical. I mean like like a fucking piston, just like just like a fucking like when you watch like a like one of those little hand massages or something. Yeah, the Tim Tams. Yeah, yeah, man. Like it was just like so fast. Like it was almost like too fast for the. And they were precise too. Like they all landed on his face. Yeah, man. And like I said, this fight would have been fun because who doesn't love a you know a flashy knockout to start the night off? But. What makes it, like, adds that extra layer of fun and intrigue is, like we talked about, O'Day's going to move down two whole weight classes coming off a knockout victory. You got to think the power and explosiveness is going gonna, is gonna to translate, you know, to, to flyweight. And we'll talk about some other flyweights we watched later in the card where I thought lack of explosiveness was pretty obvious. We'll get into that. But, oh, like yeah. Said, oh, yeah. O'Day, Osborne, Jamaican sensation – um, covers as the minus two fi- or minus two ten um, favorite, and um, he looked impressive doing it. And like I said, it's it's really hard to make projections. Like I said, you want you want to avoid the MMA math and all that. But O'Day moving down to flyweight seems like it's going to be a lot of fun just on the surface. And he called out Figueroa's brother, who yeah, who just, we're pretty high on as well. So I would definitely sign up to watch that fight. Yeah, I was really uh, impressed that he called out Francisco Figueroa too because. I mean, not to say Francisco is Davison by any means, no. but he still poses a lot of those similar threats and stylistic matchup problems for a lot of those guys down there. But Osborne's so fast and powerful that he kind of has that with them, which is oh, yeah. like strange to say. No, that's what I'm saying. Like that's what he honestly, and I. It's really tough to compare a, a prospect to a champ, but just as far as strength and explosiveness and what mm-hmm. that projects at flyweight. I think that, you know, the, the Figueroa, I mean, it may not be the craziest thing in the world. Now, we got to see, because Figueroa, what he has more than just being buff is the elite jiu-jitsu. So, I don't know. That right. may be what, what separates them there. But as far as big, strong flyweights with, with punching power, which, you know, is kind of a, a few years back would have been like a contradictory <laughs> sentence. To even it's like say, a myth. But, yeah, but this new breed of kind of power punching flyweights may be, you know, maybe a little. All divisions evolve and change and have ebbs and flows, and that might be kind of like the the, the wave we're on right now in the flyweight division. But um, yeah, a fun way to start off the night. And then I know you were high on this next guy. We'll keep him pushing to this next fight. Yeah. So w- once again, we had three featherweight fights to start the night uh, for the men's men's featherweights. But uh... and, and just kind of quick caveat there. Two, or I guess, yeah, two of these fighters of the three fights, that's not even their correct weight class, or right, their right. desired weight class, I should say. Exactly right. Yeah, that is interesting to note. And then even, uh, but so before I introduce the fighters here, I just want to note, Mark Smith was the uh, Octagon official here. If for anyone that wants to learn about MMA scoring, what happens for judges and refs, because apparently they go through the same classes, uh, all kinds of things. Mark Smith was on Joe Rogan's podcast and, like, really, really was, like, eye-opening into MMA. But he himself is more interesting than even being a fight ref. Oh, my God. I'm so glad you brought this up because I would not have remembered to bring it up. And, man, I've been watching Joe Rogan for a lot of years. Huge Joe Rogan fan. I'd be lying to you if I said he didn't inspire me to start the podcast. And just – I think most podcasters could probably say that or they're lying to themselves. But but either (laughs) way, big Joe Rogan fan. Been watching for years and years. That might have been my favorite episode ever. Oh, my God. It was so good. So good. They talked, like, all my favorite subjects. They got into UFO, MMA. Like, that signed me up. Uh, all this shit I'm into. But, yeah, like you said, maybe the most least interesting fact about this man is the fact that he's an MMA ref or a UFC ref. Excuse like me, a right world-class up. MMA ref at that, yeah. too. And it literally might be the least interesting thing about him. Like, he literally yeah. needs a Dos Equis commercial staff. Like, he has, like, <laughs> three master's degrees. Like, a, he's like a former pilot, right? He's like a, a former pilot. Uh, fighter pilot and also is in the Thunderbirds. So he was a top eight fighter pilot in the United States Air Force. Yes, yes. Like, he would be the guy that played the bad guy to train other fighter pilots. Like Correct. Know? Yeah, man. And they got into some of the highest technology that mankind's like, capable of currently. And, like, man, it was – and so I know, like, oh, why are you spending your podcast hyping up the most successful podcast on Earth? Because it's that fucking good, and that's why it's the most <laughs> successful podcast on Earth is because it's actually good. Like, it's not some flash in the pan fucking, you know, hype or new – like, man, there's a reason why Joe's on top, and I love that guy. But anyway, I'm glad you brought that up because I definitely wanted to just, man, that was so fun. I learned so much. And honestly, instantly put Mark Smith at my favorite rep, and maybe that's fair, maybe that's, that's fair, but That's what I was going to say is, like, him and Herzog could just do every fight from here on out because, like, Herzog speaks four different languages so he can talk to all the fighters. I so do like, like that. 
I, there's just certain things that, like him and Mark Smith, it seems like are willing to do for their professions and careers and lives that these other guys don't want to necessarily do. And it's just like, I don't know, I'm I almost do inspired me. by that ethic. Sometimes I'm feeling a little no nonsense Keith Peterson though. Some, you know, got it. Sometimes it gets a little too nonsensical in there. But did you yeah. know last night was the first night that they didn't introduce him as no nonsense Keith Peterson? It's because John Anik's not there. Oh, okay, okay, that's, that's right, that's right. I was like, I was like, are, 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 did he tell him to stop? Like, like, I kept waiting for it. I was like, I was like, that is oh. Keith Peterson. Like, I don't who's Keith. There's a lot of Keith Petersons out there in the world. There's only he, one no-nonsense Keith Peterson. You know what else it is? Dominic Cruz hates Keith Peterson because that's the guy that refed his fight against Cejudo who said it smelled like cigarettes and alcohol. Oh. Yeah, and DC and DC. So maybe a call little nonsense. <laughs> a little, yeah, maybe just a little. Cigarettes are fine, but if you're drinking beers for refing a fight, there might yeah, be a problem. That's not cool. That's not cool. I hope that's not the case, man. But introduce our next man, Tamir Valiev, for us. Yeah, yeah. So Tamir Valiev, minus 430 versus uh, Martin Day, plus 350. I was really big on Valiev here. Uh, he just lost to Trevin Jones, which got turned to a no contest because Trevin Jones wh- smoked weed the day before the fight. Like, come on, bro. Like, I know it doesn't give you a fighting advantage, but you know that you only get tested within the five days. Okay, I didn't know that's what the um, I didn't know that's what the drug test was failed for. I thought it might have been something more serious. I, I just weed that sucks. Yeah, so like I look at it like Valiev still lost. Now it was a flash KO. He dominated the first round, one ten eight, and then remember Trevin Jones came out, hit him with that counter right, and just completely put his lights out. Um, Maybe, you know, time was a little slowed down from the – no, not really. But uh, Martin Day is coming off a bunch of tough losses recently against yeah. pretty tough crowd of guys. Yeah. But yeah. this seemed like a fight where the UFC is trying to get Valia back on track and get Martin Day out of the league, out of the I, UFC. I, I 100% concur. I 100% concur. And, and man, Day, like I said, I was kind of coming – I think he had an 8-5 and five record, if I'm not mistaken, coming into this. But yes, a lot of those correct. guys he faced were so good. And it, that's always so hard to evaluate because it's like we knock guys with cupcake victories and, and, and record padding, but then, like, we also, like, I don't know, do we give a pass to the guys that fight monsters? I don't, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to gauge. Like, not all records are created equal, I guess I can say. Like, strength yeah. of competition. Like, and we fun. talked about that in other sports, like in college football, college basketball. We talked about strength of schedule, even NFL a little bit. But um, I feel like in MMA, sometimes it, I feel like strength of schedule isn't given kind of the gravity maybe it needs. I don't know. I feel like in Brazil and Russia, they really, like, build them early, like boxing. Like, they give them a lot of fights that they should win and build them up. Because you always see these Russians and these Brazilians come up with records of, like, 17-2, and 19-1. and yeah. one. It's their UFC debut, and you're like, where has this guy been? But then you see an American come in with a record of 6-3, and three, and you're like, what kind of salty record, but they've just been fighting better competition. Yeah, 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 for sure, man. It's interesting. It's interesting the different. It does seem to be kind of a regional approach to that. And um, but yeah, man, we got yeah, you know, like I said, fair or not, Martin Day. You know, you got to be who is, is across from you in the octagon. You know, right? You can only you can only play the person that like in football. We say you can only you know lace them up against the other team that's on the field with you. You know, but uh, and you he know, signed just, the contract to fight him. He agreed. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. But yeah, man, Valiev, we're, we're pretty high on Valiev. I mean, a lot of people are. He seems to be like a really nice rising prospect, and uh, he wants to actually drop down to Bantamweight after this. Um, but he, he's as a, a Dagestan, and we already know that's usually a problem. Like, Dude, like, he fights just like it, too. Like body lock takedowns, mat returns, just heavy, heavy top pressure. And, it, and Typical it's not like star. a... It's not like a race thing. It's just like a regional thing. Like certain, mm-hmm. like it's more of a, a, a nature or a nurture rather than nature, shall I say. Like certain regions, like, like once again, my world is football that I come from. So I'm going to compare it. Like, like if you had like a slot receiver or a corner, you want it from Louisiana or Florida, essentially. Yeah. Like the, the, there's something about the, the competition and the fast twitch. It's, it's different, man. We've seen it time and time again. And how many first round corners have come out of Miami and Florida and Florida State and, and, or LSU? Point. And like, and so the, the I compare like the Dagestani, um, like you know, fighters and wrestlers to like I said, like DBs and like slot receivers from like uh, Louisiana and Florida. It's not like a race thing; it's just like a regional kind of it's a nurture over nature, just the competition and and just being like the structure the- of how they have to play the game at corner as far as especially in the sec you have to be able to make tackles on the outside on really good running backs yeah. so if you're so that's already like an additional thing in the big 12 
you're not going to be expected to make crazy tackles out on the edge very often. Yeah. So, so a lot more zone in, in, in the Big 12. And, and so, yeah, I just – I don't know. That's what it reminds – like, when I see a fighter coming out of Dagestan, it's like when I'm watching the NFL draft and I see a corner out of LSU, I, I, I maybe watch one LSU game all year and I'm like, oh, yeah, that guy's good as fuck. He's a corner <laughs> from LSU. So that's how I feel like when I see a, when I see a fighter from Dagestan, I'm just like, oh, this motherfucker's going to be a problem. Truly. And it's, it's a stylistic thing where – they just impose their will upon guys. And it's like, if you can stop it, then you can beat them. And if you can't stop it, you're going to get absolutely destroyed. And it's, you know, what's weird is it's not the best finishing style, but it might be the most dominant style. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, and it seems almost like, like a low risk, high reward style. Cause it's right. easy to win around and you're not going to take a ton of damage fighting that style. It's pretty, pretty damn smart, man. I'm not mad at it. I'll be real. It had to grow on me. Like, before I was doing the podcast, when I was definitely more of a casual MMA fan, I got to say, I, I wasn't, you know, the most exciting to watch and, you know, getting me to buy pay-per-views and everything. But, you know, obviously the more I've learned and, the, you know, now I'm balls deep in it, I just, I, 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 you know, I've become a fan. Um, so, so I do have a question for you about this fight because it was pretty much a straightforward ass whoop, and I think we know yeah. Valiev won the fight without a question. But – Actually, I, I, yeah, all right, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to ask you how you would score it round by round. Because I yeah. opened the first 10-9, to 9, and I gave the second 10-9, and I gave the third a 10-8. But only one judge agreed with me. You know what, bro? And maybe I'm a fucking tight butthole motherfucker because I scored a 30-27. I didn't think there was enough damage really in any of the rounds to really warrant a 10-8. It just, I mean, they were dominant rounds. It was right on the verge. Like, I'm not going to die on the hill. Let me say Oh, state for that sure. Right. Like, there were some rounds that could have been a 10-8. Like, I'm not mad if you gave it a 10-8. But just me, like I said, maybe I'm kind of a stickler. Maybe I just am bloodthirsty. I don't know. I just I, I didn't see enough damage to award any 10-8. Now, obviously, I'm in the minority because all judges – two judges gave multiple 10-8s. One yeah, judge that, gave one 10-8, and you gave double, a 10-8. The double 10-8 so surprised me because I was on the edge of my 10-8 seat for, for round three. Like, it was as close to a 10-9 as a 10-8 yeah. is. I agree. I agree. I'll give you that for sure. And what's odd about that to me is that it kind of showed the judges were going to be a little loose with their scores last night. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's probably fair to say. Um, you know, just – and then as far as, you know, diving into a little bit of the X and O's of the fight, you know, Valia, there was a lot of takedowns, a lot of grapple control, a lot of ground and pound. And for fight fans, that was probably all implied the moment we said the word Dagestani. But, you know, right, I, just, right, I, didn't yeah. wanna, I didn't want to just gloss over that or kind of take it for granted. Um, I got to say, while Dave did get dominated, like, and he did, I, he showed a ton of heart and zero quit, which is really when, when a guy's a plus 350 underdog and, and he went the distance, he didn't get finished. Like, I'm not trying to give Day a pass or I know there's no moral victories. I'm just saying a, a loss against a guy like Valiev, when you're a plus 350 underdog, it's like he did it about as good as – Right, like – what was he supposed to do other than try and get like a flash knockout with a or, crazy or... Taekwondo kick? That was like his only chance. Yeah. Like essentially the, and odds makers know that that's why they put him at plus three fifty. And I'm sure the UFC matchmakers know that as well. Uh, like we alluded to earlier in them trying to get him out of the UFC by getting him to lose his fourth fight in a row. Yeah. And that's what it was. It was a sport. Now, if you look at those four guys, he lost to man. Killers. Sure, there's a, there's a lot of guys that would be. Owen Gavin Tucker fight. is a monster. Uh, I like Gavin Tucker. I, I did yeah. vote him his last fight hard. <laughs> and, and he has another loss at 45 to uh, someone else I can't remember off the top of my head that's know, even I'm better than Gavin Tucker. Uh, yeah. Casey Kenny, maybe? But it's just like. It is Casey Kenny, who we know from the, the chin of the year fight or in fight of the year candidate with him and, and um, Ali like, Helitang. Uh, uh, yeah. Casey Kinney okay. and Ali Helitang, because it's okay. Helitang taking those nasty body kicks for okay. just three rounds yeah, so, straight. So, I mean, he, he, he's lost to some good fighters. And like I said, that's always so tough. Like, honestly, man, and I, I, I don't – I mean, I don't really care that much if we're being honest, but I would love to see maybe Day go take a couple of fights in another um, organization, win them, and then make his way back to the UFC. Because he got I dealt agree. a tough hand. He did. I agree. I agree with that completely. And he has good skill set, but he just needs to progress a little further, mature them, and get them to the point where he's ready to fight guys like Valiev, because Valiev is ready to fight those upper echelon guys. Yeah, either that or, like, he literally made us need to go be a kickboxer or, or fight, um, you know, um, Muay Thai or something, because literally there's just no grappling really to speak of. Like, in, in the in 
UFC is the grappling is just rising higher and higher and higher by the by the week. It seems like. Um, yeah, and honestly, seems like a lot of the strikers, like Adesanya, is a great example. They they develop these these ground games that just negate your your grappling game. Like that's his that's Adesanya's grappling is just to negate an offensive grappler. Yeah, yeah, man, and it can be effective. It can be effective. He needs oh, to yeah. learn some of those tricks of the trade, man. But, yeah, Valiev, I mean, when you're a minus 430 favorite and you don't finish the guy, it's like, you know, I don't want to – I don't. I mean, a win's a win. You can't hold a win against the guy. I would have liked to see the finish. I know you predicted a finish. I mean, we both kind of thought I, we were going to see a finish. I definitely just thought it was going to be a Dagestani handcuff TKO against the cage Him just landing too many shots. Now, Martin Day, like you said – just super game, super tough, never quit. And 30-25 is a dominant victory, but it is not a finish. No, it is not a finish. Yeah. And, and like I said, and I don't I did, neither of us scored at 30-25. And I guess you could say who are we to disagree with the UFC judges, but anybody that's watched the UFC judges, yeah. they, you know, they're not that infallible. They can definitely they're not past being called out to say the least. Um yeah, Chris but Bell like I said, sucks. I mean, not going to die on those hills because Valiev clearly won the fight. Um, and, and, yeah, we'll keep it. But, oh, and, and one last thing. Valiev, after the fight, like I said, kind of similar to Osborne, he said he wanted to move down the weight class. Now, he doesn't want to move down two weight classes like Osborne, but he said he wants his next fight to be at Bantamweight, and he seemed, like, dead set on it. And, honestly, just, just looking at him, he looked like he had 10 pounds to lose. Like, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, he was in shape, but he wasn't, like, shredded out. Like, he could he could lose 10 pounds of water. And I would, I would think him losing 10 pounds makes him pretty damn dangerous considering his grappling strength. If he doesn't sap the strength out of him to get that weight, he's going to be a problem at 35. Big problem, like big problem. Think, I mean, when you think of bantam weights, you typically think of strikers. Like, it may be an overgeneralization, but it, yeah. So to the dominant Dagestani wrestler at bantam, oh my god, is it should his next fight be against? Was it Umar? Umar, Umar? Uh, yeah. Which one? Uh, um, Which one's Umar. the bantam one? Umar. Umar, yeah. <laughs> to, hey, that'd be sick. I mean, two unranked bantam weight grapplers. I don't know. I mean, I doubt. I doubt the matchmakers will want – they'll probably want to push that down the road when let him build up a little more, but I'd, I'd be I, down to watch it. I would say that, except for what they did to Fahea and Benil Dariush last night, which we'll get to, but yeah. uh, they show they don't really care. They just want to True. see who the cream, of, the cream of the crop is, which, once which again, respect like. to the UFC. Yeah, respect to the UFC. I kind of like. It seems really pure. Now, at the high end, we all know it's not as pure. And it's about the big money pay per views, which I'm not even mad at either. It's a business, but uh, but at the at the lower levels, they've been savage as far as not letting guys oh, build dude. up and like just throwing them to the lines. They have, which like I said, for guys like Martin Day sucks, but for the guys that weather the storm, by the time they do get to their big fights, they're battle tested. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, if we keep it pushing to the next fight, yes, it's 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 a great example of exactly that. Uh, 145 yeah, again, like we talked about. Yusuf Zalal versus uh, Sung Woo Choi. Um, Zalal minus 240. Choi plus 200. Uh, so Zalal looked to be the favorite here. Stylistically, if from my breakdown of it, he ha held the advantage if he just fought his fight. Um, oh, my God, bro. I, and, like, just real quick, I'll let you get back to it. But I have so much to say about this fight. I am so frustrated by it. I'm so mixed up about this fight that, like, I disagree with my own notes. If that makes any fucking sense, and we'll get into that <laughs> when we when we get to the the how the finish and all that. Uh, I just this fight has me feeling so many types of ways. Like I said, I literally disagree with my own notes. If that makes any sense, but let, let's go round by round. Let's break. Let's do a classic beefy boys breakdown, and then we'll get to opinions after we get to the fact. So really weird that Zalal opened the fight, better movement, faster fighter landing nice jabs, keeping the distance. But then at the very end of the round, he lets Choi get the takedown and land some, like, hard combos. And I, I threw up my scoring into, into disarray. I, I was going to give it to Zalal, and then I was like, I don't actually know. All right, I'm dead. Oh, so you did so good right there, man. Uh, first off, just quick, quick note. Um, Choi plus 200 underdog, Zalal minus 230 favorite. So Zalal was heavily favored, and I was, I was pulling for Zalal. We like Zalal. Um, and so – I was also conflicted in round one. I felt like Twitter and even the judges and like, I don't know, Ev, the whole world seemed like it was just so obviously Choi. Like it was just a no brainer. Like, oh, Choi clearly won that round. And I disagree with that. Like I said, I gave it to Zalal. I kind of don't feel great about giving it to Zalal. <laughs> but 
I'm just saying it was a lot. Like everybody just made it seem like Troy. Oh, that was clearly Troy. And I just I disagree with that. Maybe I'm splitting hairs. I because the thing was, for like seventy percent of the round, Zolal was just pumping that jab like a masterpiece. Like goddamn Muhammad Ali just floating on the outside, pumping that jab, circling off gorgeous. the cage. It was great. It was gorgeous. And then at least at the very end, he gave up the takedown. But I feel like Troy didn't really do anything with the takedown. And I feel like everybody was just like, oh, takedown equals Choi. And I just, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of just disagree with that. Like, I will take – no, and I know I'm kind of – like, fans of the podcast know that I usually value the end of the round. And that takedown did happen at the end of the round. So I'm not trying to talk out of both sides of my neck. But I'll take three minutes of gorgeous jab pumping over a last-minute takedown that resulted in nothing. Like, I don't know. Like, I'll take, I'll take the – the seventy percent of the round with the gorgeous jab pumping, like maybe that's a personal preference. I don't know, but uh, instead, I ended up giving round one to Zalal. I'm not like necessarily gonna die on that hill, but I just don't feel like everybody was just like, oh yeah, no brainer, Troy round one. Like I don't, I disagree with that. You know what was weird that I started to think about too as the fight progressed was that Troy wasn't landing explicitly hard. Like those weren't the hardest shots he was landing, but Zalal didn't wear them well. Like when he would get hit, he would like float away and then seem like he was bothered by getting hit. And it's like, and I, I get it. Like everyone's bothered by getting hit, but like the appearance of his actions and motions for whenever Choi would try to engage him almost made it seem like he was respecting the power whenever I could tell that it didn't need to have that much respect on it. I'll say just physically looking at him, Choi's the much larger man. Like, before yeah. weight cut, he probably walks around 15, 20 pounds heavier than Zalal if they were just, like, in a street fight. Um, so, I, I, he looked just like the much larger, stronger man. So, may, I mean, maybe that had something to do with that. Uh, now, now move, keeping it pushing to round two. Also, I guess now, because it started in round one, because Zalal, like I said, he the, the first – Three minutes, I want to say, of round one, Zalal looked phenomenal. Stay on the outside, pumping the jab. Like, the exact game plan that you would write out for a fighter, a striker like Zalal. And then out of kind of nowhere, and maybe somebody that knows more than me can illustrate how it didn't come out of nowhere, or maybe there was some reason of it that escapes me. But to, from my perspective, it seemed like pointless and counterintuitive. Zalal started going for these takedowns. And they weren't great takedowns. They didn't have great timing. They took. They were the kind of takedowns that just literally just do nothing but milk the, just zap the energy out of you. Just had them against the cage, like hands not even connected. Just like what are you doing? Like it was. It was. It was really. It almost was like a rugby scrum. Like he just was like this, and like it wasn't really. He wasn't inflicting damage. He wasn't advancing position. He really wasn't even getting the takedown. It Wasn't just, really he controlling the position. No, he did nothing. But and, and like I said, up until this point, his strength and his clear advantage, and it looked absolutely gorgeous, was staying on the outside and pumping the jab. Yeah, and movements and brain striking. Like that's and he's a Muay Thai guy from Factory X. Like that's what he should be good at. Like what's it like on the on the spectrum? If there's outside pumping the jab, the exact opposite of that would be like inside shooting shitty takedowns. And he, he literally went polar opposite of what was working. Like I said, it's, it wasn't just this on-paper strategy because he was a striker. It was working. And, and he just abandoned it and went for these shitty takedowns. And I, I, he lost himself the fight. And that's a hill I will die on. Oh, yeah. And I think, we, I think that's what we both said to each other when we were texting about it, is that he was electively losing the fight. It wasn't that he couldn't have won those rounds. It was almost like he took the wrong approach by which yes. to win the round. And it was just like... Hey, you're beating yourself before you even are, uh, like, getting to win. I don't understand uh -huh. it. Like, it's crazy, yeah. man. It's crazy. I was frustrated. And like I said, I'm, it's not like I'm the biggest Zalal fan, but, like, I was pulling for Zalal. I, I want to see Zalal's career do well. I, I've enjoyed watching the fight. He's been active, you know. And uh, I just – he did himself no favors. And now I'm starting to question the fight IQ. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause I it's agree. one thing to get out, out grappled by a guy that brings it to you when you're a striker and has you moving backwards. But if when, when you're a striker and you engage in grappling that like leads to you losing the fight. Now I'm just questioning fight IQ. I'm questioning coaching. I'm questioning just the whole, the whole situation. And I will say that Mark Montoya is the coach out there at factory X. And he was also coaching for, oh, there's another person that found this card, but uh, interesting to note because uh, the whole next fight that he was out there, you can hear Mark Montoya yelling at his fighter, like, 
hey, that's not our game plan. That's not our game plan. I think they have a problem game planning out there. It seems like it, man, because that was a shitty game plan. Or like I said, I don't know if it was a shitty game plan or if he abandoned the good game plan. Like, I don't – I still hard well, for me to diagnose it, which of it those. It seems like both of his fighters last night abandoned the game plans that he had given them. So it's almost like they don't trust what he's putting out. Oh, that's another layer. That's another layer. And, like, that's sure, a man. bigger problem than anything. And, then, and then, yeah, and so it's keeping it pushing as far as the breakdown goes. I gave round two to Choi. I thought that was the most clear cut round there was, was round two. Choi's pretty dominant. Not dominant enough for a 10 8. There was a 10 9 Choi in round two. He had definitely, he, that's when he started really taking the, um, the, growing the gap in significant strikes. And, and I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, and then, so, and then in round three, I guess I get more controversial. And this is where I'm saying, I guess I kind of disagree with myself. Because I actually gave round three to Zalal. Oh, I did too. Take, the takedowns finally, I guess if you want to say paid off, I don't really think – I think paid off is too strong of a term. But he finally got, I think, two takedowns in round three. And he got that deep – it was a guillotine attempt, I believe, right? Yes, uh, which, was, he, which he – he got the takedown and then sat back for the guillotine, almost, almost making everyone else in the octagon aware, oh, he knows he's down two rounds. Yeah, 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 which, you know, I – I don't know. It, it was a weird fight. So I gave Zalal round three. You gave Zalal round three. And then so – but when it comes down to the judging, two judges get scored at 29-28 uh, Choi, and one judge scored at 30-27 Choi. See, and, I'm, with, I'm with the first two judges, but that 30-27 I can't see. So you had Choi re- winning one and two? Mm-hmm, yeah. I'm not mad at that. Like I said, I, round one was like a toss-up, and I don't even know in retrospect how I feel about giving it to Zalal. But live, live looking at it, I gave it to Zalal. And it was only the third fight, so I wasn't even drunk yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, man, I, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not going to die on the hill because Zalal, I'm so mad at his strategy. And I, you know, I don't even think he deserved to win this fight, if that makes sense. But my scorecard did have him winning it. Now, like I said, I'm not going to die on the hill, but the 30-27 judge can get the fuck out of here for sure. Yeah, um, that was absolutely ridiculous to me. Yeah, absolutely but like ridiculous. I said, the law's dumb strategy and whether it was a bad game plan or abandonment of a game plan, I don't know which one it was, but regardless, like I said, even kind of going against my own scorecard, Zalal didn't deserve to win the fight because he just did everything kind of wrong, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think if you took that fight as an entire 15 minutes, it's probably Choi that wins that fight, right? Like out of a 15-minute block. Yeah, I agree. It was a weird thing where breaking it up into rounds made it really complicated on my scorecard. Yeah, I I can totally agree with that. Because the argument can be made that Zalal round one. Like I said, if you don't give it to him, that's fine. Like I said, I valued that jab a lot. I thought it was absolutely gorgeous. And then – and then, in, and then round two, Choi 100% won. And then in round three, we both gave to Zalal. And I think two of the judges gave round three to Zalal. So, I mean, it, it, but when you break it, you're right. When you, if, you, if it was the old school days with no rounds and just one long fight, yeah. Choi definitely wins. But breaking it down into those rounds does kind of complicate things and add in a factor. You know what's weird, man, is my takeaway from this fight is just disappointment in Zalal. Because this is a fight yeah. he should have won, showed that he had the ability to win. Yep. And then just quit doing what he needed to do to win. Yeah, he doesn't fight to his strengths. Um, and, it, and I think what happens to some fighters, right? So you have these strengths. And what's the logical thing? You work on your weaknesses. But then they spend nine weeks training their weaknesses, and they're used to doing that. So then they fight to their weaknesses instead of their strengths. I think, right, I'm yeah. not saying that happens all the time, but certain guys, I think that's a, like a lot of strikers, you know, like, like it's the law, essentially a perfect example. Like, I, I guarantee you his coaches were like, you need to work on your grappling. I think his last loss, he lost to a grappler. And then, so I bet he just drilled grappling for, you know, nine weeks straight or however long the camp was, and then came in just trying to be takedown McGee, trying to think he was Daniel Cormier. Well, it's, I think a, a good reverse example is Ronda Rousey. She was dominating everyone with her grappling, and then she went and changed coaches. This coach started telling her, oh, your striking is amazing. Your striking is so great. She started trying to strike with girls and got her head knocked off her shoulders and had to quit the game, so... Yeah, man. I think I think fighters need – no, it's all good. I'm not saying don't round out your game or fill the holes, but remember who you are and, you know, fight to your strengths, man. Like like I said, win, win lose, or draw, Conor McGregor's not out there trying to take motherfuckers down. Like, he's going to win, lose, or – that left hand is where he's either riding or dying by the left hand. Like, it's either good. But 
Look how far that's taken him. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. Two like, belts. Two belts. Like Khabib, Khabib didn't try to all of a sudden become Adesanya. You know what I'm saying? Right. Did. And, and well, Israel right. didn't try to grapple. Like, he and just tries to strike. Khabib. Exactly, man. You got to, like I said, work on your holes, round out your game, but don't forget who you are, man. And we'll keep it pushing to um, another upset coming up. Yes, sir. So we had uh, women's flyweight here, 125, Molly McCann, minus 130 versus Laura Procopio. Plus one ten. Uh, just, just a quick side note. I can't stand McMahon or McCann. Either of those women fighters. I, I McMahon's say, like the forty-year-old, and McCann yeah. is this chick. I, I gotta say, I do like McCann's nickname, Molly Meatball McCann. That's pretty. I, don't know, I like it. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's just like it's fitting though, right? Because she's just a meatball in the octagon. And I saw nothing from her that I wanted to keep her around in the UFC for. No, and then she threw, uh, she, she threw her gloves in the octagon after the match. Uh, is not retired. She tweeted at DC and DC last night. Uh, DC and Cruz, I should say. He doesn't deserve the nickname DC. But tweeted at her or tweeted at them after and said, no, I left my gloves in the octagon because my father passed away during this camp. And, like, those are just for him. Well, great. You lost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I – Especially just right out coming off the Dan Hooker thing, like I'm just tired of seeing fighters yeah. like like throw their gloves in the ring whenever it's not meaning what it's supposed to mean. Like I don't know, I just like when Khabib did it, I like stopped what I was doing and like was like in shock because he would only do that meaning like I'm done. That's why, like, man. From the very jump, everybody can go back and watch older podcasts. I've said this whole time, Khabib's done. Mm-hmm. And you're probably right, which we'll get into it, too, because the 155 rankings, which we'll have to talk about later, but they still have him held as champ, and it's like, Dana, get off it, dude. But you, did you see also last night they didn't, they didn't consider his win streak active? Really? Uh, they, yeah, everybody was t- tweeting about that because, um, because you're right on that hand, and if you look on the UFC's website for rankings, he's still ranked as the champ, but – whenever they were talking about longest win streak in lightweight, they gave it to Charles Oliveira. Yeah, Dana's got to strip that belt, man. They're it's just, just time. trying to have their cake and eat it, too. I know Dana does not want to do it. It's very clear. But it's time. Everybody, like, even, like, commentators, people that work for the UFC, like, I haven't heard one person really come out and be on Dana's side and say, we don't need to move this division forward. I mean, every all of my favorite MMA analysts, my personal opinion, your personal opinion, I've yet to really hear anybody be like, you know, they need to tie up this division, even though Khabib said he's retired 30,000 times. Like, my, I've yet my, to hear anybody support that besides my, Dana. My favorite was Poirier after the fight uh, when he beat McGregor, and they asked him, like, something about Khabib, and he said, look, man, that guy's retired. Like, Dana said that he wants to, like, see something impressive and come back. Khabib didn't say that's what Dana said. Yeah, exactly. And I was just like, yeah, that is what Dana said because Dana's out here promoting his brand. It's his job. Yeah. Yeah, it's his but job. Like I said, I'm not time. taking shots at Dana. It's just But at not, the same like, time, like when it's time to strip the belt, it's time to strip, time the, to belt. strip the belt. No, I 100% agree, man. Um, I um, I scored this fight 30-27 per copio. Um, me too. Only one judge agreed with me. Um, one judge scored at 29-27. How did yeah, that happen? Round, what, no uh, no what round was a 10-8? What, what round was a 10-8? For, uh, so they – they gave they gave McCann a ten eight. Is that how they arrived? No, no, no. At? So they gave they gave McCann around and Procopio around, and then gave Procopio a ten eight oh, round. Okay, okay, yeah, that just seems like unnecessary to to like muddy the waters. Like I don't know, man. I also uh, don't then, know what round McCann won. Yeah, very. Also, also was definitely going to be the next oh, thing out of my mouth. I know what round it was. Oh yeah, it was round two because because of the arm, the arm bar. Because yeah. they gave you can't so much give credit somebody to it. a round before an arm bar attempt, right? She, I mean, I mean, she got it locked out for seven seconds and then lost it again, and it's and got restacked, and it's like she was really close to finishing, right? Like, like three quarters of the way there, but you could just tell from whenever she got the arm locked out and couldn't finish. It was never going to happen. Prokofio had too good of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, she kept her thumb free, was, was rotating her arm, flipping her hips, I mean, and then got back out. It, yeah, you, yeah, seven seconds, like you just said, and, and who knows if that's the exact number, but let's go with seven seconds. It's like you can't give somebody a round for seven good seconds. The round's five minutes. She won the other fucking four minutes and 53 seconds, and you're going to lose her the round? Like, I, I mean, I know it was a deep arm bar, but that's – you can't consider a deep sub that doesn't finish the same as like a strike that wobbles somebody. And I think that's what they kind of tried to do there. 
Although I'm gonna, I'll be talking out both sides of my neck if I said that because I have said before that a deep submission attempt should be looked at like a knockdown. I, I think I think it can, in, but in context, like you can't get dominated the rest of the round. Like it's not enough to make up for that. Right. No, in if, which, if you get dominated for a round, but then at the end of the round knock the guy down, I think that's enough to steal a round. But you you get a sub attempt in the middle of a round. And for that last seven seconds and then get dominated before and after the sub attempt, I just don't see it the same way. Yeah, and I, agree. And I will say as well that uh, Procopio initiated that whole grappling sequence by getting a takedown and then McCann hit, hit the armbar off the takedown. So it was just still defensive for her. It wasn't an offensive move, essentially. Well, and that's what armbars have become in the modern UFC, right? Like they're, they're more mm-hmm. of a defensive move. Um, like uh, back in the day, you gra- people would try to set up arm bars. Like that's how they wanted to get their finish. But I feel like now MMA has evolved to the point where like you almost get caught in an arm bar when you're on top and you're trying to ground and pound and shit. You know, what people I'm are not- people are just too good at, on both yeah. sides of it now for arm bars to be as effective as they used to be. And DC, I think that's I'm so happy you said that because DC said that last night yeah. in the broadcast. Said you know we used to be told don't throw that elbow over the top because they'll catch your arm and go for the arm bar, but he was like, the game has just evolved past that at this point. 100%, man. And so, yeah, like I said, I, I scored all rounds for Procopio. Procopio's grappling, her ground and pound. I mean, that was pretty much the story of the night, grappling, ground and pound. Like I said, I didn't give any rounds to McCann. Um, you know, another underdog, Cassius. And, um, you know, Procopio, she's a good grappler, but it's not like I really – Ah, uh, except for the fact that it's women's flyweight. If it was any other division, I'd be like, oh, well, I don't really see you making noise. But in women's flyweight is just so thin. It's wide open. I mean, you, you string three wins together and you're in the conversation. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I hate uh, it, but it's so true, man. It's, it's so it's true. true. So it's like if it was literally any other weight class, I'd be like, oh, you know, Procopio, you know, I don't really care one way or another. But in women's flyweight, you kind of have, have a caveat of like, may end up being a kind of a factor, just kind of out of process of elimination. You know what, though? Check this out. I think I just realized how they scored 29-27. They gave McCann the second round based on the armbar threat, and then Procopio got a heel hook almost locked into the third, and I bet, and she dominated the whole round. So then I bet they turned around and said, well, if I gave McCann the round for getting an armbar deep, even though she lost the whole round, then I have to give Procopio a 10 8 when she dominates the whole round yeah. and gets a sub locked in. Yeah. So there is at least consistency in the thought process there. In the thought process. That's also like dangerous, though, to like. That's so cause, dangerous cause that to give it, rounds it, on sub attempts. What? And, 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 and like to have like a weird precedent set to where like if you score round one wrong, but you can't like keep referring to that round to set your precedent because you fuck. Like I think you're better off just kind of. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't like even, I, 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 I appreciate the consistency, but I don't like the thought process itself. Even weirder, thanks to Mark Smith's insight, we know that they're all taught the same scoring standards and go to like an actual school for judging and get passed uh, yeah. based on their judging abilities. They get credentialed by like Herb Dean and, and John McCarthy in the NS, NSAC and Andy Foster in the CSAC. I, I know, and, and it's I, like, I don't how? know how I'm feeling about that now because I've been questioning Herb Dean lately and I'm like, no Me what? too. If Herb Dean's the one training these fucking judges, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No, he, uh, and really that's the thing is like he is the guy that like tells them like scoring criteria, not scoring criteria, but like ebbs and flows with fight, what they're looking for, what he's watching you know, uh, things that are small, illegal things that you have to watch for. Yeah. He's giving them all this nuanced information, and then it's like some judges just don't give a shit about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've we all taken classes where, you know, we didn't you know, <laughs> pay attention to every detail. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're humans, but uh, I feel it, man. We'll keep it pushing this next fight because I just feel like this next fight's a better fight and, and more Great fun fight. to talk about. Great fight. Yeah, man. Great uh, fight. So we got uh, uh, Carol Hosa. 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 Uh, as the minus 220 favorite, fighting Jocelyn Edwards, plus 175 underdog. And um, we were both pretty high on Edwards coming off her because she just fought like two or three weeks ago. And she was yeah, uh, the first great. Panamanian fighter, the first Panamanian woman fighter, I forget. But, you know, she's and she's super athletic and she's super game. And there's a lot of things to like about Edwards. And when I first saw this money line, and I got to admit, and this is why, people, you don't hear a lot of betting advice coming from me. Harrison will tell you what to do. I'll tell you what not to do. You can't <laughs> bet a fight where you don't know both fighters. Because I'll be the first to admit, true, I didn't know so jack true. shit about Carol Hosa. And I was pretty goddamn high on Jocelyn Edwards. 
So, like, when I first saw the money line, I was like, damn, Edwards at a plus 175? That's a good number to get her at. But then, like, just prime example of, I mean, you don't know what is the uh, – there's two sides to the equation. And if you only have half of it, you can't act like you know the answer to that equation. Um, so, I just, like I said, you won't hear much betting advice from me. But if, you are, if you're high on one fighter and don't know dick about the other fighter, don't feel good about your bet. Man, I got all my underdogs last night except for the last one, and it ruined my parlay. So sad. So oh, man, sad. That sucks. That it's all sucks. right, though, you know. Um, I will say for Carol Hosa, uh, only reason I knew about her before this, she's done a grappling tournament against Julie Avila before. Oh, okay, cool. Um, Hosa's a beast, man. And, no, and I, think this is a, I think this is a great point that you've already brought up, which is it's so hard to judge, like, Edwards versus her last opponent versus Hosa now because what's the skill gap between those two opponents and stylistically what's the matchup differential the matchup yeah I felt like this was a horrible matchup for Edwards terrible um, matchup for Edwards terrible and it was exploited yeah. in the first round and I gotta say though too because I mean I'm on the last time on the podcast I went on and on and on about how explosive of an athlete Edwards and she is an explosive athlete but I mean her escape from full melt in the first round was amazing that was I'm just saying though like Hosa didn't look like outgunned. Like, as far as, like, Hosa was a strong, athletic girl herself. Like, Edwards' last fight, she just out, like, she was the physically dominant athlete in the octagon, and, and she she performed as such. But, I, I mean, I'm not saying she wouldn't, like, beat Ro Hosa in, like, a 40-yard dash, but I'm just saying, like, Hosa held her own, like, athletically. Like, she took Edwards' biggest advantage over most fighters, which is her athleticism, and kind of neutralized it because she's pretty strong and athletic herself. And I will also say that Hosa took a, almost a page out of Poirier's book in this fight in which she was jumping some powerful leg kicks on yes. Edwards' lead leg, yes. which oh, I'm yeah. sure great stopped point. the athleticism and slows her down a bit. Fact. Great, great, great point. I'm so glad you brought that up because I didn't have it in my notes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I gave Hosa – you know, I scored a 30-27. All the judges scored a 30-27. Round two was the closest round because Edwards – started landing like some huge like haymaker combo she hit like a seven punch combo and landed all seven and split open host's mouth like a joker style like cut. a joker style cut yes and uh blood was just literally everywhere like it was pouring so, pouring so much blood like so much blood yeah man i mean it's hard to compare it but uh so much blood was coming out of that cut and at first they thought the nose was busted but then it ended up being like the inside of the mouth uh, inside of the mouth uh, <laughs> Not hilarious so, that hilarious that Brendan Fitzgerald called that it was a cut and and Cruz was like ah I'm pretty sure it's a broken nose you don't see much blood from a cut usually and then like started to slowly back backtrack as the whole round went on and at the end he was like you know what I think that is a cut which you know <laughs> I gotta take this opportunity to say like Dominic Cruz it's well documented on BT Boy my least favorite commentator to the point yeah. where like I love DC but like he even managed me like to take the fun out of DC. And I know I try to say DC, <laughs> DC has like two, cause DC is like a mirror, right? Like he's a chameleon. So like when he's with Rogan, he has too much fun. It gets too loosey goosey. And then when he's with Cruz, he matches that energy. And it's just like two librarians calling the fight. You know what Dude, I mean? Dude, like, and it's and so I, tough I know they're whenever. they're so knowledgeable, but it's just well, no fun. And like DC's personality will come out sometimes. And he'll be like, look, I'm not saying this guy doesn't have this. And then Dominic Cruz feels the inclination to some reason to be like, no, we know that DC. You're not trying to disrespect anybody. It's just this and, and this. Like, and it's like, takes this just fun thing. Oh, I know. It's it, it fun. Yeah, he focuses on the negative. It's like you're refocusing the negative. It's like, just let DC get back to the positive like he will. Yeah, it was coming full circle. You just didn't yeah. even get there. Yeah, no, oh. bro. I just, I do not enjoy when Dominic, and I know. He's a great fighter, and I know a lot of people love him. And I, I think he brings a lot to the game as far as fight IQ. And, like, he does break things down well. It's just, like, so do textbooks, and they're boring. You know what I'm I saying? Wish, like, I wish they would do Dominic Cruz, like, fight predictions and fight breakdowns and then yeah. not let him actually call the live fight because he like, does some shit in the film room that's outstanding. Yeah, like, I would love to see a Dominic Cruz, like, detail episode or, like, you know yes, what I'm saying? Or, yes, yeah, but But as far as, like... This is an entertainment, like, yes, it's sports, but it's entertainment. And, like, we're, it's supposed to be a vibe. And that's one of my favorite things about fight nights. Is, you know, we're drinking, we're hanging out, we're having a good time, and we're watching fights. And then Cruz just comes with the energy of, like, a 70-year-old librarian, like I said. Uh, but, sorry, I had to, had to fire off my Cruz takes. But, it, uh, it, it, Cruz feels like if, like, Aaron Rodgers called the game versus Tony Romo calling the game. Like, Aaron Rodgers is going to be a surly asshole at points. 
Yeah, exactly. And Aaron Rodgers is going to break down the X's and O's, and he knows the game, but is it going to be fun or enjoyable? Is he going to be nice about it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is he going to play nice with others and kind of, you know, toss the ball back and forth? And that's what, yeah, not a fan of Cruz um, commentary. But, um, but yeah, man, in, in round two, it's like there was so much blood. This is where you got to be careful judging MMA fights, too. It's like, I damn it. It's like the my gut instinct kind of before, just no thought to it, just natural reaction was like, oh, my God, all that blood, she lost the round. But she clearly won the round. She, it was almost like, uh, you know, she dominated the round, really. But, yeah, all, uh, I mean, besides that one round. sequence, she, I mean, she got pieced up right there, but she survived it and then performed well afterwards. So it can be tricky, though, because it's like, how is that woman that looks like she's been, like, in a horror film, she's the winner, and the other girl looks fine, and she's the loser? It, it can get tricky to the naked eye, which not really if you give it thought, which is what I did, and I ended up giving the round to – to host it, like I said, just knee-jerk reaction. It's kind of easy to be like, oh, yeah, I mean, clearly that girl lost the, that round. Kind of similar to uh, Clay Guida with, like, how yeah. much scar tissue he has now and the way he fights. Like, he looks like he loses every fight he takes now <laughs> after the fight, but his style, I mean, it, it just dominates the, the round, like, scoring style. Yep. So. Yeah, it's, it's two different animals for sure, man. Um, and then, yeah, and then, you know, host some more, more, more position and more ground and pound in round three, and, yeah, um, I think we both agree, and all three judges agree, 30-27 unanimous decision for Carol I thought, that was the, and, I thought that was the easiest fight score of the whole night. That, yeah, was, a not, that yeah. was not a stoppage. Yeah, exactly. It made a lot of sense. Um, I said, I'm not down on Edwards. Edwards is so green. You can tell mm-hmm. she has so much to learn. Like she, she definitely needs to put in a lot of time and have some more higher-level training partners and things like that. And I, I, but it's one of those things where I don't think that like she's like done or oh like like I think she ran into a really high-level fighter in Hosa. Yeah. I think Hosa's gonna go on to you know having like you know she's she's good man. She's really I, good. She, she can strike. Hosa's, she can grab. I think Hosa's technique outweighed Edwards' athleticism and like frame and style 100%. essentially and explosiveness. So uh, if, if Edwards can just hone her, her technique in, she could eventually be better than Hosa. It's just like you said, she's got to take those steps and technique. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think like Edwards has a high ceiling. She's like yes. the NBA draft yes. pick. That's like a freak athlete, but has an inconsistent jumper. Like is she, it can go one of two ways. You know what I'm saying? Like, is she going to refine her game or is she just going to be another, you know, athletic wing that that's out of the league in three years. And like, it's like, is she going to be Markel Fultz or is she going to be Jason Tatum? Yeah, no, for sure, man. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, like I said, I'm not down on Edwards. I think there's a lot of out of shape bantam weights that could fight at flyweight, but they don't want to cut the weight. And I think, I think Edwards starches a lot of those bantam weights that fall under that umbrella. I think, I think there's a lot of bantam weights that, that Edwards can beat. I mean, she's going to always kind of struggle with like those super high end grapplers just because she's, so far behind the eight ball, but um, I think there's a lot of um, you know, w- women's bantam weights that Edwards matches up against. Well, I'm so happy I, you made that point as well. That I think there are a lot of women's bantam weights that could make that ten pound drop down to I do flyweight too. and I, actually I, have a way easier run there too. I, I agree, man. And I know women's bodies are different, and it's hard to project, but I see that a lot in women's bantam weight. It like, I, and it's not like a, it's their choice. You know, I'm just saying, like, if I was their coach, I would be advising them to move to flyweight. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it is what it is. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, this is one of those fights where I'm high on both of these fighters coming out of this. I mean, Edwards went the distance with a high-level fighter. She didn't get submitted. I mean, Hosa obviously has a really nice skill set, uh, mainly on the ground. But, I mean um, – Nice yeah, low I mean, kicks, honestly, good like, grappling. But, I mean, that's I a good recipe a, for victories, honestly. Low I got to put the rat on the table. Besides the low kicks, Edwards dominated the stand-up. Like, when they were throwing yeah. hands, Edwards was – I mean – she throws some heat, man. She's, yeah. Now, she, she kind of like has the, the Clay Guida wild man punches. But, uh, <laughs> but she uh, lands them. They, she's so fast, she lands She's long. Them. She's long. Yes, yes. So it's not like, and we'll get to it to, actually this next fight, but Justin James throws the wild man punches, but he's like stumpy. So he has to like throw his whole, like literally lunge into it. But Edna you know has an athletic build to where she can actually throw the, the winging punches without lunging into them. It's a perfect transition. Let's go ahead and dive into it because I, I, I think what that whole point you just made is the entirety of the reason that this fight went the way it did for Justin James. Yeah. Uh, so we, we got no nonsense in this fight with Keith Peterson. Uh, <laughs> 160, so there is some nonsense because that's not a real weight class. Catch um, weight, but see, I, I, I like, I like, <laughs> I catch, like weight. catch weights. I like catch weights because like, it gives both guys to get a fight that doesn't necessarily have to be in a named weight class but it could be more comfortable for both of them to fight at, and in which case yeah. we might get a better fight. 
Yeah, that's that's the first place my mind goes. Is like, oh, these guys didn't kill themselves before this fight. Like that's the that's the first place my mind goes. Is like these guys also, didn't have a tough weight cut. Do you hate Justin Jane's nickname? Because I do. The Guitar Hero. I, I don't what the hate. Fuck? I mean, I do hate it. I just. What does that have to do with fighting? <laughs> Like, and, like, he didn't even make that game anymore. Like, he clearly came no. up with that nickname in, like, 2006. Cause he's, you know what I'm saying? And then just, I, just, I just don't get it at all. I mean, and he's the plus 300 underdog. So, it's like, hey, man, why don't you become, like, uh, anything else? Justin the Drill Bit he, James. He should, like, <laughs> he should be the wild man. That's how he fights. Justin yeah. the wild man James. Like, uh, yeah. Hey, hey, that's a, you know, or the haymaker. I mean, anything because that's all he does. He literally Donkey Kong punches. I mean, there's more to it because he actually does like the little level change and then comes back yes. over the top and he switches hands. Like he's mastered it. He's got like a black belt. Like, <laughs> in, in wild man punches. Like they, they like to the naked eye, they look like the schoolyard Donkey Kong. But then, like when they, when they were breaking it down, there is a little bit of method to the madness. But he's just like it's like he's put all his chips into just the like. Fighting like a wild man. It's fun. It's uh, fun. Who doesn't uh, like uh, watching a James fight? Essentially, he's acknowledged, like, yeah, my arms are short and I'm short for this weight. So I'm going to do what I have to do. Whereas he's fighting Devontae, I don't know his nickname, but the Heisman Smith. Yeah, and... that's what he should be. That would yeah, be sick. That would be at this point. Uh, who is minus 360. So big favorite. Crazy athlete. Cra like, he looked crazy athletic in there. Coming off an Achilles tear. Yeah, how I know. Often, I know. How often, like, first fight back from an Achilles. Like, we actually just watched it with what? Uh, but, but, uh, but guys usually don't look that athletic coming off an Achilles tear. Like, even if they perform well, they don't look, like, explosive. But he's right. athletically phenomenal, which you love to see. I mean, God damn it. That's, I mean, that can cripple people, I mean, that injury. I mean, that could – and there's people that rupture their Achilles and walk with a cane for the rest of their lives. So to see him come back and, and look that good, I mean, you got to love it. Um, and he and, must and have some say, pretty serious power, too. Oh, yeah, definitely, without a doubt, and just so athletic. Um, also had an eight-inch reach advantage, which we just spent time <laughs> talking about James's short arms, but that's pretty wild at, at 160. At some of the bigger weight classes, you can see those wild reach changes because they're so – like what does a middleweight look like? Like they can look, they can be six four, right. five eleven. Yeah, but, Kelvin uh, Gaslam, uh, Paulo Costa, very different humans. Exactly. Um, but yeah, the smaller weight classes you usually don't see an eight inch reach advantage uh, change. But uh, man, Smith looked phenomenal. Um, you know, just precise striking, jabs and straights. It's like honestly, couldn't get too much different fighters because everything Smith uh, throws is straight down the pipe. And everything James Thrones is is curvy and loopy. So I mean, really, I mean it. it pretty predictable how that usually ends up. Like t unless, yeah. typically, unless unless loopy guy catches him with one lucky shot, straight down the pipe is almost always the winner. Almost always, almost always. Um, you know, but like a guy like James, you just never quite know. Like it ain't over until the fat lady sings with a guy like that. Because he's got real power. I mean, he put out Frank Camacho when he was a huge underdog on short notice uh, a yeah. couple months ago. And so and he yeah. has this crazy power base, but And I like hard Justin James. Like, like, I root for him because, like I said, his first UFC fight, he, he fought for years and years and years on the local circuit. I mean, look at him. He's bald. And, uh, and, and then he finally got his chance on short notice. He wins in this flashy knockout. And then, I mean – Win, lose, or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying it's been storybook, but you fast forward a few months, and he's the feature prelim. That's a good point. It's a really good point. And I he mean, was he's the and... feature prelim because the real feature prelim got moved to the main <laughs> car. And he's like, but, but I'm just saying, I'm happy for the guy. Like, he's built his stock, you know, probably better than he could have imagined. Yeah, and I will say for him, like, for what he fights with, like, his attributes, does great for, for what he was given. Not a lot of height, not a lot of reach. He makes chicken salad out of chicken shit for sure. Like I said, it's hard, it's hard not to root for a guy like that. But in this particular fight, I mean, he was definitely outclassed and definitely got beat up. Uh, round one, 10-9 Smith, I imagine you scored it the same. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Devontae Smith's out there making chicken salad with chicken and salad. You know, <laughs> yeah, it was just yeah, easy. Yeah. That, that high-end organic chicken, he's so athletic. <laughs> but, uh, but, man, yeah, round two, it was a, it was a weird one because um, uh, – so was it the, at the end of the round, or did they stop it? I, I, I forget. So, so it was at the end of the round because Smith was piecing him up hard to start the round, and you could see like he was he, that uh, James caught a bad shot on the way down whenever Smith hit the takedown, 
or kind of dropped him slash took him down, whatever you want to call it, uh, with about three minutes to go in the round. And then Smith got up into full mount and started putting on more pressure on him and eventually took his back, both hooks in, but then James, being a warrior, escapes position. By the time he escapes, gets squeezed around the neck, this huge hematoma is built up right under his eye, probably a broken orbital. Um, and immediately, and I mean immediately, no nonsense, Peterson stops the fight. And is, is well, like, Peterson time. calls in the doctor. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. like, time, come look. He like instantly is like, time, come look. Like, it was bad. It was so bad it, that I wrote doctor's going to stop this one before he even did. Well, the, like, I feel like Keith Peterson and the doctor didn't even say any words. They just gave each other a look. Like, it was just like, oh, yeah. Like, this oh, is like, like, oh, oh, yeah, this hilarious is like, because you could hear Justin James, uh, Keith Peterson and the ref, like, he turns to the ref and he's like, can you fight? And the ref look, or the doctor just looks at him and goes, like no, it was almost like he, he didn't even have to like say shit. He like turned around, and was like no, and then yeah, Justin yeah, yeah. and Justin Jay's like, oh, what I can fight, and then dude, not thirty seconds later, when the doctor's talking to him, he goes, can you see? And you hear Justin James go, not really, no, like, <laughs> oh my god, but dude. that's what makes Justin James Justin James. You know what I'm saying? Like Justin James is that reckless abandon, just. He's that he's that guy, and I know it doesn't even this analogy doesn't even work with the modern football rules. But back when football, because you could actually hit people in my childhood, we all had those teammates that were shut out Stefan, where it was either going to be a highlight or a whiff. Yes, like like, you, like zero form tackle. You, it was either going to be just a KO, like, <laughs> leaping the feet, head shot, my, Michael Barrett, modern day targeting. Or it was going to be a complete whiff, and they were going to grab it. Like most- Modern day targeting. That's true, though. True. Like, those players don't exist anymore, I imagine. I mean, I don't play, but I imagine that most <laughs> teams don't have that guy anymore. But anyway, it used to be a fun part of the game. And uh, and, and and I'm just saying, like, that's Justin James. And, and like I said, it doesn't really do him any favors, but it also got him to where he's at. So, like, he's, he's dancing with the date that he brought, and I, I respect it. I really yeah, I was going to say, as far as a fan, like, I love that he doesn't quit and that he's just down to sling and throw fists at whoever they put across from him. I do respect Ever. that. Yeah, man. And, and yeah, like I said, I mean, like I said, I don't know. It may be his last five. I don't, I don't, it's, it's not like I, I'm a Justin James fan as far as like, you know, I think he's going to go on to have this great career, but just as far as just like, he's just a throwback. You know what I'm saying? He's a. He, no. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's like, Justin James reminds me of almost like if Randy Couture was young. Like, yeah, man, that's how I feel like. It's a dude that's just super game. Like, he knows well, he, he doesn't necessarily have skills. He's what used to be. Like, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It's Back before point. everybody was, like, a fucking master at every discipline, it was just a couple of, you know, guys that have been in some trouble in their life. And, you know, they some some down throw some hands. And, you know. Yeah. Just, I mean, Frank Trigg, Sean Shirk, these are all guys that, like, remind me of his fight style. Like, big looping punches, diving in, just being tough as hell. Yeah, man. And, and that wraps up the prelims, which ended up being a badass prelim card. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. I really Oh, did. yeah. Uh, uh, honestly, I was, a worried, card. I was a little worried the main card wouldn't live up to the prelims just because the prelims had a couple really good fights. Did, and I was getting nervous for that. But I'll be honestly, real, I, I wasn't worried about this main card. This main card, I, I had faith in it. It delivered. Um, I, was worried about the two, I was worried about the two old guys being a snoozer, and I was worried about – uh, I didn't know what Menel Cap, Cap was going to look like because the fight organization he came from, uh, they could wear shoes. So I want to dive deep into that because I know nothing about Cop, and I'm super interested how you fight the number five ranked guy as a debut. I want to get into that. What up, everybody? And we're back, and we're breaking down UFC Vegas 18, Overeem versus Volkov, and we're to the main card. Appreciate everybody that watched the prelims, and now we're going to dive into the big boys, both – Literally and figuratively. And um, and yeah, we're going to talk over in Volkov. We're going to talk Sanhagen Edgar. We get my beefy brother back on here with us. Hey, yo, we're back. Sorry, I was back, trying bro. to make me wait a little too long to load the, load the refresh. Oh, yeah, no, no worries, bro. Um. And, man, last night's main card was so fun. And I think I'm going to make a little spicy prediction. Maybe not. We were talking about it a little bit yesterday when we were texting. But uh, I think it, it, I think it's, I think this main card that from last night is going to be better than the main card from next week at UFC 258, which last 100%. night's card was free. And next week's card is 
like 80 bucks. So I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm so upset that, it, which shout out to Dana, not stopping illegal streams. I wouldn't know other than Twitter, but shout out to Dana for not succeeding. Appreciate you know what? Minute. Real quick. You sound quiet in? for me real quick. I'm going to try to turn up my volume or something. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. No, no, it was mine and not yours. So I will say for, uh, for, for Dana, he apparently did shut down one of those guys. Well, one guy. Who gives a shit about one guy? Suck my dick, Dana. That's kind of where I'm at. Like, you didn't get all of them. If you don't get all of them, you you didn't get it. Yeah, so. like, that's literally just fucking with one dude. Like, I don't know. That's like arresting one drug dealer and thinking you stop. And then you stop the drug problem. Drugs. Yeah. Yeah, it's like no one crack dealer, please. You gotta get Escobar. But yeah, man, I won't. I won't die on that hill today. Uh, amazing main card. Amazing main card. Uh, disappointed by the first fight because I'm a big slow fan, but you know. Yeah, man, and, and this this next fight I feel like gives us plenty to talk about, so we'll dive into it. We have um, Mike Rodriguez, and I had him as a minus two forty um, favorite. Yep. Is that what you had? All right, yep, and he's fighting uh, Danilo Marquez, who's eleven and two, or I guess he was ten and two going into this. Spoiler alert! And then a uh, plus two hundred underdog though. Um, they're fighting that light heavyweight, and I and I texted you this last night, and I think we both agree. I was like, hey, man, is Marquez the biggest light heavyweight in the division? And Dude, he is like, huge. Probably. And I think he used to fight heavyweight, if I'm not mistaken. But um, It makes sense because he's thick, too. Like, he's, he's a so thick 6'6". Six, six. He's 6'6", six, six and, like, legitimately big. Like, he looks like an NFL tight end or something. Like, he's huge. Like, uh, he ha- like in the octagon, he has to be blown back up to, like, 235, 240 at least. Like, he's so big. It's got to be something close, man. Like, at least 225 because, like, he is blown up in there. Yeah, man. He's absolutely massive. Um, and, and, yeah, um, I got to say, like, on the feet, striking-wise, he does kind of seem like a tad bit slow, like you would kind of expect from a, a huge guy like that. But I feel like his other skills kind of, like, offset that a little bit. He kind of reminds me of, like, a bigger Damian Maya in the sense that his striking is pretty rudimentary, but it's just yeah. enough to allow him to get into that, that, like, A range, right? Right? The close range. And then yeah. essentially lock up, grappling, and yes. get, get to his positions. Which, you know what's great about that? That's the exact opposite of what Yusuf Zawal did. Yep, yep. No, exactly. This guy understands his skill set. He strengthened his weaknesses and still fights with his strengths. Yes, yes. And, and yeah, game plan-wise, and, like, the ability to execute a game plan. So this was the classic, essentially, grappling versus striking matchup. And everybody knows if the grappler is able to make it a grappling match and implement his game plan, they typically win. And if the striker is able to make it a strike fest, they typically win. And, um, and Marquez just was – decisively able to implement his game plan, which which I, I'm always a fan. It's like a nuanced thing about fighting that, like, I'm a big fan of when a guy – because there's one thing about just, you know, a fight going well for a guy, but, like, when a, like a fighter sets out to do one specific thing and is able to accomplish that one specific thing, I don't know, I think there's something to be said about that. For sure, yeah, because it's like Mike Rodriguez came to this fight. His, by the way, both these guys have an insane reach. Insane. Like, I'm pretty sure Rodriguez was 80 inches and Danilo Marquez was 78.5, which is like, for people wondering at home, that's a six foot eight wingspan versus a six foot six and a half wingspan. Now, Mike Rodriguez is only 6'2, and he has the arms of a 6'8 man. You would think he'd be a shooting guard. Yeah. Yeah, that's a basketball body for sure. That's wild. Um, But yeah, so to get into it, man. I literally wrote down that Marquez was stuck to Rodriguez like glue. Like, he would get body locks, he would get over-unders, and he, I mean, would get him to the cage and just keep the fight there, which is a little dangerous because Rodriguez has really good elbows in the clinch, but you could tell Marquez did a really great job to tuck his head, keep it in positions where he couldn't get struck, and then would work to sweep the leg out or keep Rodriguez so off balance that he couldn't throw those elbows in the clinch. And, man, like, I know size isn't everything – LOL, insert your joke here. But uh, <laughs> size, size isn't everything in fighting. But, man, in that particular fight, it seemed to have a whole lot to do with it. Because, like, like you're, when you're talking about your ability for Marquez is to kind of keep him where he wanted him to be, he was just the bigger, stronger man, was he not? Like, I mean, I know it's more complex than that. But just to boil it down, Marquez was just 
putting him where he wanted him in, and keeping him there for the most part, you know, just being the bigger, stronger man. You know, uh, weirdly enough, the, uh, this is a complete side note from this fight, but Mike Rodriguez's nickname is Slow, S-L-O. I don't even understand that. And then Danilo Marquez doesn't have a nickname. This would have been the worst nickname fight you could have seen on paper. The only thing that – I wonder if he's from San Luis Obispo. There's a town out here in Cali, like a beach town in central California. Oh, SLO. And, and it's called San Luis Obispo, and they call it Slow. So I, maybe he's from there. Oh. I, have no, I have no idea. I, as a, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm a dumbass that don't have my laptop turned on, and it's old and shitty, and it takes forever to boot up. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where he's from. I'm sure we can figure out pretty easily. But, uh, man, um, yeah, Marquez, again, 10-9 first round because he grappled him and dominated him, but there wasn't a lot of damage to speak of. And then um, in round two, though, man, Marquez is, is able to finish the fight with a rear naked choke. And uh, what I thought was so dope, because typically rear naked chokes are one of your more – mundane submissions not the flashiest not the most entertaining but what was cool about this one was that he switched on at the last minute yeah that, that was yeah sick. yeah like, yeah and he put rodriguez out in like four seconds when he actually put the squeeze on like he must have an insane squeeze an insane squeeze like i said that just looked so clean because he was like fighting you know he was fighting it this way and then he just came from that way i forget which arm it was which but yeah you're right <laughs> Sw sunk the left end to finish it and then honestly rodriguez peeled the top hand off and he switched to the the palm to palm and and that's what they always say is if your top hand gets peeled that means you can sink your other arm further and so when you go from here you just switch it to that and i oh. mean you can feel your whenever you do that grip switch for anyone at home you can feel your actual bicep like inflate and your chest inflate so like the the squeeze actually gets magnified when you do it that way oh wow that's interesting yeah man uh i just thought man i swear him switching arms like that i thought that was every bit as cool as like a flashy knockout like like yeah it was just so cool you don't see it every day and like it was just so like smooth like it looked like he was like losing and then he was like haha the technique of it was nice man and that's i think that's the story of Mar marquez this whole fight was that his technique was so good and he in the positions he was in and he knew that coming in, so he worked to get to those positions. And it was just beautiful, man. I, I really appreciate And especially at a plus 200 underdog, like yeah. this looked like he was just – like he should have been the favorite. Yeah, no, he looked – he dominated from, from Bell to when it stopped. And um, and we got – and then also in round two, it wasn't all just boring grappling. And, and not that grappling is boring, but I'm saying like it, there was plenty of action. And round two, he really stepped up his ground and pound. His ground and pound looked gnarly too. He was he was he was landing some big shots, some clean shots. And he's so tall, he was posturing up. Yeah, no, he he, he looked good in round two for sure, even even before the sub. Um, and then we got to talk. I, we were talking about this a little bit last night. Like so, after I watched that, because I was like, he's so big, his technique so good. I was like, let's fucking crank up this hype train. And I was like, kind of. Like, <laughs> yeah, this. that's right. That's and right. Then, and then they were like, oh, he's on a four or five win streak. I was like, let's go some fucking start shoveling some coal, baby. Let's get that hype train officially rolling, bro. Because, I, I mean, like I said, I'm not saying he, he, he he's, he's unbeatable or anything. But what I'm saying is he's going to have a size advantage over every single light heavyweight. Maybe there's somebody else out there, but. Essentially, he's going to have the size advantage over every single person he's in the cage. Which they, that's not everything, but that's one advantage you can just chalk up before they even get off the bus. And yep. then his grappling is really, really elite, like like really good. And you mix that with the strength and the size, and, and like he's going to be a problem. Like, uh, and, and and there's been big grapplers before that couldn't quite figure it out or put it together. But at four on a four fight win streak, he's clearly figured out how to translate those attributes into success in the octagon which that's half the battle because every fighter has things they bring to the table like or they wouldn't be there and and it's like who can make their skill set translate into wins and, and effectiveness inside the octagon on fight day and uh and he seems to have demonstrated that ability it is going to be very interesting if they give him like a 6-2 like athlete power puncher 205 guy yes. it's gonna be super interesting Yes, I think that is where he's going to struggle. If there's, if there's a, a fast striker that can keep him on the feet, which the obvious example is style bender, but until you get there, is there another style bender that can do that? Like, is there is there like an elite striker that can keep well, that? And even still, the... style bender's just now coming to 205. He's actually a 185. True. So, 
so I'm it's already, almost like I'm already projecting that double strap, baby. <laughs> and, oh, me too. I'm with you. I mean, we got a little more than a month, but yeah, I'm with you. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I think that like for Marquez, he's got to be getting close to like a ranked fight. He's got to be yeah. getting close to a, a top 15 guy, especially yeah, after dude. dominating slow that way. Totally. I 100% agree. It's like I said, I don't know. We'll start throwing a couple calls in there. Maybe not the full shovel load yet, but the hype train, I don't know. He's, he's an interesting 205-er. And, um, you know, 205 hasn't been the deepest weight class lately. It's no, you know, it's not like bantamweight or lightweight. So, uh, you, you know, know, it's... Uh, uh, Anthony Smith would be a fun little test for Marquez. Maybe not yet. Maybe maybe one fight in between there. But if he wins his next one, go ahead and give him an Anthony Smith and let's see what he can do. Or maybe what about giving him the guy that Anthony Smith beat? That uh, what was it? Uh, oh, uh, not to, I, 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 it's not Devonte Smith. It's it's. I feel like it's a D name though. But I don't know. But the guy that Anthony Smith, the young hot shot prospect that was supposed to beat Anthony Smith on that when they made uh, headline that fight night a few months back. Mm -hmm. uh, something, something like that. I don't know. I feel you just like a ramp up. I, I'm, I'm interested to see what Marquez can do in this division, but um, we'll keep it pushing because this next fight is the fight we've both been just fucking chomping at the bit mm. to get to, man. Uh, uh, Devin Clark is the guy we're thinking of. Devin, Devin Clark. Clark. Oh, it was a D name. I wasn't off. Correct. Yeah. Yes, sir. Which, okay, so the next fight, man, uh, actually the next five fights, I can't wait. All five of these fights are yeah. fantastic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This, coming into this fight, I had a few friends ask me, like, what fights should I be on the lookout for? What's the fight to watch? Uh, actually, Jimmy asked me yesterday when I was talking to him, like, yo, what's, are there any good fights? I literally said Diego Fajaya and Benil Dariush probably fight of the night. It did get fight of the night. Both yes, guys got did. 50 G bonuses. And yes. very deservedly so. These guys have fought before. Dariush holds the win. However, Fajaya has been on this big win streak and is when now ranked ahead of him. Uh, four years that? ago. Or five okay. years ago. No, it's 2021. Wow. Okay, yeah. so yeah, it's been a minute. That's and Fahea last night coming into this fight, 17-2. and two. So one of his two losses was Dariush. Wow. So I didn't yeah. even know all that context. I'll be right, I didn't dive that deep. That's really interesting. Yeah, so you knew this fight was going to be a fun one. And even rankings McGee had to have known this was going to be a fun fight, yeah. right? Like 10 yeah, versus 13. Yeah, And especially at 155, because like you did after this fight, brought up the rankings to see what, what could be next for – for the yeah. winner and loser here. And it's yeah, just like, it. it's just like 55 is, I mean, murderer's row at 15 and up. It's just murderer's row at 15 and up. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, man. And um, yeah, five and I, like you said, it was, it was pretty much a pick em. The odds I have written down were plus 100 uh, for Heda and uh, minus 120 Dariush. Is that what you had? Yep. That's right. Okay. All right. So yeah, pretty much a pick em. Um, I'm, a lot of the talking heads that I listened to and watched were big on Darius coming into this fight. Um, you know, rightfully so, as, as it, you know, as it, as it played out. But uh, what I loved about this fight was a the activity, b it took place both on the feet and on the ground, like almost fifty fifty, like like uh, at a high level at, too. At a high level, yes, and, and then yeah, both guys were game. It was, just, it was just a great fight. There were storylines behind it. I mean, almost everything you want from a fight, especially this low on a card, you really can't ask for more. Right? And that's why I'm saying that this main card is probably going to be better than next week's main card. Because tell me what next week's main card, like four fights down, looks like. I bet it ain't this. It's not great. It is definitely not great, man. Yeah. I mean, other than Usman Burns, and that's going to be a war. So you're going to – I mean, I'm going to buy the pay-per-view just because that's a war of a fight. Yeah. But the, yeah, the rest of the main card is just. Eh. Yeah, yeah. So, so the great fight, great matchup. And in round one, it started off. It delivered everything we wanted it to deliver. Um, you know, it was an absolute banger. Uh, I now, you know, I have a ten nine Darius round me, one. Me too. But I was gonna. I was just about to ask you how you scored it because I think there's an interesting note. Darius was a little hurt at the end of that round because right when the bell rang, uh, you see Darius start to turn toward his corner. And, you know, he's obviously in the middle of a fight, doesn't think about the cameras, but you see him on his face, he just goes, like, damn, I would, that could have got bad. And he, like, walks back to his corner, and I was like, ooh, you were a little rocked at the end of that round. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and that's what I said. Like, I started this off with all caps banger, and, and you don't I wrote that all too. Caps, yeah, all caps banger. All caps banger unless you land some good shots. So, yeah, I mean, like, it's, if Fajeda didn't get dominated, he landed some great shots. Both men were exchanging 
Um, I thought that Dariush's grappling top position and his ground and pound were, was what kind of swung it one way or another to me. You know what I mean? I thought that's what gave him the edge was, was the grappling. And shout out, Jimmy. Thanks for watching, brother. Yeah, and, shout out, Jim. And, uh, and man, um, yeah, I just I thought I thought that Darius <laughs> did enough on the ground to 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 steal him round one. I don't know if you agree. I completely agree. I had it ten nine for Darius, and this is a really interesting scorecard for these judges too. So it's I'm really excited to hear how you have all these rounds scored individually. So we both went ten nine Darius. Now I thought the second round was a little bit more of the same. Honestly, it was a nice takedown to open the round. And just Dariush's pace was relentless. Like, they were trading a lot, but he was just relentlessly leading the action and had that takedown. Yeah, I thought round two was not as close as round one. Round one was right. way closer. Like, a, like, if a judge gave round one to Fajeda, I wouldn't even have been mad at him. But uh, round two, I thought, was clearly Dariush. Um, like you said, kind of, kind of more the same. Multiple takedowns and just the constant forward pressure. Like, both forward pressure and top pressure. Those are, like, two different things that I'll sometimes get, like, interchanged but like forward pressure is like moving forward taking the fight to your opponent top pressure is when you're like grappling and you're actually literally pushing down on top of them using yeah, like gravity pinning and, them and, to the floor yeah and he and he did both of those uh, los dos uh, he, he, <laughs> did, he did he i thought he did, that was just on full display in round two yeah, I, like i said man the the pace that he was coming with yes. was just insane like he showed no slowing down and he was eating some pretty hard shots like both guys were eating hard shots but, yes, oh, were, and he also dropped him in this round with the knee to the body. He did. He did. I forgot about that. Yes, he did. That was. I forgot about it almost as well because Fajaya played it off really well. Like, you he saw did. him kind of take a knee, but then he actually pulled up into guard and defended pretty well there. Yeah, that was a really smart strategy because, like, he kind of did the thing. Like, a lot of people get hit with a big body shot or liver shot, and they kind of collapse. And he, he kind of did that, but he, like, turned his collapsing into pulling guard. Like, that, at least right. that's like, which is a brilliant strategy and a great way to best show best thing you can do there. Actively defensive, you're still act intelligently defending because um, a lot of guys just kind of crumple there and then get finished. So yeah, no, great. I'm glad you brought that up. I also want to bring up. I feel like you can't talk about this fight or Darius in general without bringing up like how deceiving the gray hair is. Dude, I know he's only like thirty, right? Yeah, I mean he's not that old. He just he just went gray early, just bad genetics. <laughs> I mean, granted, his hairline's hanging in there strong. Sometimes thick hairline, gotta thick make hairline. A, make a you know, it's like pick your poison. You want the gray hair or the hairline? Uh, you know, not everybody gets it all, but his hairline's hanging in there strong. But the premature gray, it's very deceiving. He looks like somebody's dad in there. He looks like he's like a thirty-nine year old man. Especially because he has, like, thick body hair, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he, yeah, he looks like that. your stereotype dad. Yeah, he has that, like, not even dad bod as far as, like, gut, but just the, the hair and the, the gray. <laughs> and, and the, yeah, the, the, oh, he has that, that old man strength, too. He's just, like, 45, but doesn't, he has, like, all the <laughs> characteristics of a 45-year-old, but none of the bad characteristics. Um, and I got to say, what I like about Dariush is that, Tiptoes that line between taking risks and being reckless. Like yes, Ma maybe right up, goes over it a little at times. He, like like he's a little like he's more reserved than like a Guida or like we were talking about like you know um, when we were talking about um, James Ed, Jocelyn Edwards or James, oh yeah all those guys all those guys like he's more like I said he walks right up to that Justin James line without crossing it and, and but another thing he does it I was it is in that video you sent me where he was talking post fight kind of let us in on that he does it all with a greater strategy in mind which is what separates him from those guys like Guida and James and there's a swing from the hips guy because he'll swing from the hips and he'll trade one and eat one but it's all with the, the mind of getting the takedown and shooting afterwards. And he kind of let us in on, on that game plan a little bit in his post-fight interview. But, uh, it, but yeah, I don't know. I think so he walks right up to that reckless kind of reckless abandoned line. And so he said maybe he even dances on it a little bit. Uh, but, but he still kind of he, – he doesn't lose the forest through the trees. You know what I mean? He keeps the greater game plan in mind. And he, like I said, he just walks right up to that line and he doesn't go, you know, just – head first past it. And I think the other thing I really respect about him too is his mentality when he's in the octagon and this is his own self admission is he's in there to either go out on a shield or go out as the victor. Yes. He doesn't want there to be any kind of question in between. 
So this was like a, the the closest you can get, obviously, on fight scoring. It was a split decision. Um, but the other thing, I- yeah, I disagree with that as well. So here, let's just get into the third in the third round real fast. Um, I thought Darius won the round because he did more damage and had the takedown at the end. But I could have seen you going for Fajaya there, but not really. Yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, 100% echo those sentiments. I um, I literally wrote in my notes, the first thing I wrote, which is kind of to your point that it was a close round, and probably the closest round, because it, it, um, it was also the round with the most time spent on the feet. Um, yes, Darius was. It's crazy, because Darius was dominating the grappling, but... Fajeda's grappling was – he was throwing up a ton of submissions from the bottom and, and it had some gorgeous, silky, smooth transitions and was making a lot of really smart decisions on the grappling. So it's like he got dominated because he was on his back more. But as far as a guy being on his back, he was about as active as you could be. And, and like, I, I feel like – because we, we're seeing how, fight, how close this fight was and how great of a fight it was, and it won the fight of the night bonus. But I feel like we're only talking about the good things Darius did because he did – we did have him win in the rounds. But I – Fajeda was like because we usually hear the term floating on top, but he was almost floating from the bottom. He was like, a yeah, great, like great motion and transitions, and was throwing up shit from the bottom. And it, I mean, I he, think he, one time he escaped from north south by going out the back. It was like, yeah. he, it was really. But oh, and also one of the times he tried to reverse Daryush, and Daryush was smart enough to fall backwards into him so that he couldn't take his yeah. back, and he spun around when he did the fall. That was one of those, like, unnatural motions, but you trust your technique so much. Like, he fought every instinct in his body. Like, fight or flight is telling you to go forward, and you're like, no, the logical technique is to go backwards. Yeah, like, I got to sit into the chair and spin into it. And it's like, and that kept him in top control. Impressive. And I don't know, I'm always making these weird skateboarding analogies, but that happens. There's certain, like, maneuvers and tricks on skateboarding that, like, it feels so unnatural, but you know that, like, if I can just make my body do this motion, it'll turn out good in the end, even though it feels like you're doing the wrong thing. And any skater out there will relate to that, like a lot of like front <laughs> side things in the mini ramp. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, I don't know. It, that, that's what it reminded me of for sure. But, yeah, and so um, I gained round three to Darius, too. So I – and maybe this is spicy on my end. Not really. I don't think so, but I don't know. I scored at 30-27, Darius. Like, am I out I, of line? I also scored at 30-27. And I was – I almost shit myself whenever Bruce Buffer started reading the scores because that obviously indicates a split decision. And I was like, wait, who could have given two rounds to Fajaya? Now, when we talked about it, obviously, and just broke it down, we both agreed one and three were very close. But I think yes. it's some bullshit if you lean to him for one and three when yes. obviously Darius got two. A hundred percent. Like I said, the words, if somebody gave Fajeda one, like, I'm not mad at it. Like, I get it. Like, it was a close round. And then round three, I said, both men were landing. But I don't know, maybe that's up for interpretation as well. Because I literally just wrote, I gave I gave round three to Darius because he landed harder. So maybe the judge thought he didn't I, land harder. But I don't know. Yeah, it's a weird thing that, like, uh, activity versus damage. That's a really yeah. weird part of the scoring department that no judge has consistency on. Yeah, man. So it turned out to be a split decision, which a lot, and we weren't the only ones that disagreed. Almost every post fight show I saw, I think Joe Bond was like, "Yeah, this wasn't a split." But uh, like a, a lot of people disagree with it being a split. But it's one of those splits where the right man wins. So as we love to say here on on BP Boys Breakdown, we're not going to die on that hill. Won't we die right for it, but like, damn, like it's so, it was so close to the wrong guy winning, and that's yeah. the hill I would die on, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. It's just like, what are you watching? What's uh, it's tough because it's a close fight. I think it's the prime example, and we've talked about this before, where. Uh, uh, just because a guy wins all three rounds doesn't mean he dominated the fight. Like you can win all three rounds by a fucking nut hair, but you still won all three rounds. That's still a thirty twenty seven. Frank Yeager has a Frank Yeager has a great ability to do that throughout his career to edge out rounds and win rounds on scorecards. Yeah, man, it's it's crazy, and we talk about it all the time how the scorecard doesn't tell the full story. And this would have, this would in our scorecards, we both had a thirty twenty seven, but we would also both come and tell you it was a razor thin fight. Like, both can be true. Yeah, it's super weird to think about me seeing this score as 30-27, but knowing in my head, like, oh, this fight was uh, pretty much a coin flip. Yes, yes, 100%. It's a weird dynamic, but we both had it that way. I'll, there's a lot. There's, so there's two more things I want to talk about before we keep it pushing. I want to talk about how when given the opportunity to call his own shot, he puts on his boy. 
He, so yeah, asked, Michael Perez. To, they want who? Who do you want to call out next? What's next for you? And he was like, you know, all that, whatever. You got UFC needs to sign my boy. He's the best. I think he said flyweight in the world. That's a big claim. Um, crazy. But That's a crazy claim. Fighters, I've seen so many fighters on Twitter and Instagram co-sign him. Like, yeah, this guy really? needs to get signed as a bad motherfucker. Yeah, Darius is not the only person like ride or like put it like co-signing that would be the term yeah other fighters are vouching and co-signing for that as well so so that was just class Ariel made a post about it on instagram just how it was class personified and and, and man darius just loved that guy i wish i wish the ufc gave darius more respect because he's the most respectful guy to them as an organization like the fact that he came out and apologized to Sean Shelby directly in his post-fight interview and said, hey, I'm sorry for being upset that you made me fight for Haya. I just feel like both of us deserved different guys to fight because we're both on win streaks. Like, why do you pit us against each other in this point when we've already fought each other once? Yeah, it was a weird matchmaking. I feel it. It worked, though, from the Rankins-McGay perspective. Uh, That's what I will say is that, like, 13 versus 10, man, like, you can't be mad. That's a matchup. hard to argue. Yeah, Yeah. it's hard to argue because you guys are right in the same area. And honestly, you're both riding win streaks. Like, let's see who to push. Like, for Sean Shelby, it's like, who do I push? And then it's like, if you're Darius and you're sitting at 13 and they give you a top 10 that's not an absolute, like, monster, a guy you beat before, at kind of a favorable, like, so So check this I, out. I so do you want to do you want to go through one through nine real fast for the 155 so we can what, talk what, about Darius's what, next? We don't even have to do one. We have five through nine will cover it because let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, he's not getting a title. I, the, the, the top end is so congested. We've talked about that ad nauseum. Who is it's the top a, four right now? It's Oliveira, uh, Chandler, Chandler Poirier, Poirier, and Gaethje. Right? That's one through Gaethje. four. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and if it's not, that's what it should be. Uh, well, that's what it. Yeah, that's what that's what it has to be. Yeah, yeah, man. But uh, and then so. Uh, and it's crazy with these rankings. So these rankings I'm listing out are really all moved up one because these rankings are still factoring in Khabib as the champ. Right, correct. Um, so so that's an interesting dynamic too. But uh, So number five is Tony. Number six is Connor. Number seven is RDA. Number eight is Hooker. Number nine is Felder. Man, so Darius will get put to 10 or he'll get put to nine and Felder will go to 10. Either way, I mean, that's... That's yeah. a minimal difference. But, you know, you said it last night. I didn't know about it, but the RDA makes the most sense. Makes the most sense. Cause How fun would their grappling exchanges be? God, like? it'd be fun, man. And, like, and both I, think, trade too. I think Dariush gives RDA a big matchup problem. Because when RDA fought Covington, when he fought Woodley, when he fights those guys that are punchers to get into a shot, he struggles. When he gets put up against the cage and just beaten up on – and not actually taken down, he struggles. That's that. I love that. That's good shit right there, bro. That's good context to put it in. You know what I want to say though? Moving forward, all those fighters I just named, those five fighters: Tony, Connor, RDA, Hooker, Felder. I don't. Wouldn't you give all those fighters the athletic advantage over Darius as far as yeah, fighters? absolutely. And a few of them I'd give the technical advantage too, which is like the scary thing where like. Darius, I think, is the gatekeeper at 55, man, because I don't see him in the top six scenario. I'll put it this way, though. If Darius gets Felder or Hooker on the ground, I mean, he's, I mean, you know, that could easily turn in his favor. Easily. Absolutely. Like, like he Absolutely. Has a marked grappling advantage, um, but he also has a marked striking disadvantage, so that's kind of give and take. Um, just kind of depends who's able to implement their strategy, which we touched on earlier. Um, now, RDA is interesting – because I think that might be one of those fights, especially with the guy's game as Darius, where the grappling negates itself and it turns into an absolute slugfest. Like, that could be a fight of the year candidate. Like, oh, yeah. May, maybe oh, yeah. I'm overhyping, but I just – I see fireworks in my head when I think of that matchup. And then if it does go to the ground, that transitions will be fucking porn. Um, what a, what Connor, about what about a Kevin – happen because of just – it's Connor. They don't just let him fight anybody. Right. It's, it's just it's no. a different category. And just, I got to be real. Maybe I'm not giving Tony enough love. Maybe I'm being too much of a ranking. McGee. I don't know. Call it what you will. Darius, Tony, I wouldn't be mad at coming off two L's by Tony. I don't hate that fight at all. Either. I don't hate it. I don't hate it at all either. But my question is, what are we going to do with the uh, old inactive Kevin Lee? Like, do you make Darius defend his spot in the top 10 once before you give him a top five? I mean, I wouldn't, but I also wouldn't like shit on that if it happened. 
because Kevin Lee Dariush is a fun fight. Now Kevin Lee just sits at rank twelve, so it's almost like Dariush has to turn around and fight the guy that was just in front of him. Yeah, that's why I wouldn't necessarily like that. Wouldn't be my go-to, but I also like wouldn't die on that kill. I wouldn't. I wouldn't kill McManus and Sean Shelby for that matchup. I mean, that'd, that'd be fine. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just I feel like Dariush Felder, Dariush Hooker, those are the most likely to happen. Now, Felder, you know, he's not the most active fighter, so that always gets tricky. And then Hooker, you know, he's coming off that bad loss and, you know, threw his gloves in the ring, and it didn't seem like he's in a real itch to get in there real soon. Um, now, granted, Dar, you said when did he want to fight next? He said April or May because his daughter's being born in June, so that's not a, a quick point. turnaround. That's, that's a good not point. a quick turnaround, so that gives Felder or Hooker time to, you know, get ready. I would love to see Felder with a full camp, man. They always throw him in late nowadays because he's like this, like, you know, he's a name. But it's like, give Felder a full fight camp for someone. Let's see if he's still a 155 that's legit. No, that, uh, that's why I think it would be fun. Like, they're both respectful guys. It would be great sportsmanship. It would be a great yeah. example of Sportsmanship MMA. there would be off the charts. It would be off the charts. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's arguments for all those. I even think – Darius Connor would be a good fight if we're strictly talking X's and O's, but it's just there's a whole different X factor that comes with Connor that it's just not it's why waste our breath. But I think it would be fun. Both guys would be down to trade. Darius probably has the grappling advantage. I mean, I'm, I mean, at this point of Connor's career, like it's not like out of line. Now it'll never happen. But right, that's the thing is like skill sets. That's a fun fight that would yeah. like. And honestly, it'd be good for Connor because I think that's when Connor wins. Yeah. I, like, I, and it helps why. him get back on track. And, like, the UFC should have. Shab talked about this on his podcast, um, I think, a week ago, which is like Connor was begging for a fight yes. between the two, between January and January, because he knew that, like, Rust is real and these top four guys in my division are very real. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, and we've seen the active fighters be the guy that gets on rolls lately. I mean, Kevin like, Holland. Holland or Shimaev. Or, I mean, I'm not saying those are the only examples, but, I mean, I don't know. It seems like, what do they say, fortune favors the brave? Like, that, that, that's Yeah, that. it's true, though. Like, if you, if you go for it, you get rewarded sometimes. No, all right, so just one last final take, and we'll keep it pushing. Gun to your head, who are you matching up? What, what's the fight? What, who, who's next for Darius if, if you're Mick Maynard? All right, I'm going Dariush RDA, and then I'm going to do Fahea and Kevin Lee. I love the Fahea Kevin Lee. You know, and maybe this is just a fan of me. Maybe this isn't me being McMahon. This is me being Dominic. But I, I think I'm doing Dariush Felder. I think I just think that would be I so think much either fun. one is just a great matchup. And honestly, yeah. RDA and Felder just fought each other. So kind of works out that way, too. Yeah, you get, logic- get to decide. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know they like to do win coming off a win versus coming off a win. So that's probably to happen. But I just think I don't think that's a good fight for Felder too. Like I said, if you get Felder Dariush on a full training camp, like that's not him getting the short end of the stick. Like you could argue he got in the RDA fight. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Yeah, I like that, I think like, on a, I, think I think Felder, on a full camp, that's all day for him. Like it, it well, not all day. Like that he wins, but that he has it a good performance and actually proves that he belongs to that ranking. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. And uh, we'll keep it pushing because I also have plenty to get into on this next fight, and you have plenty to get into and, and inform me upon. Yes, listen, sir. I, I'm literally just dying to know more about Kape. Like I said, a wise, one of my favorite sayings in the whole world, universe, lexicon, whatever, is a wise man knows what he doesn't know. I may get that tied in one day, but a wise a good man knows what he doesn't know. Or a wise man knows what he doesn't know, I think is what it is. But anyway – and I don't know shit about Cape, and I was confused as fuck when they said it was his debut versus ranked number five Pantoja. Um, GSP is coming out of retirement to smack all of them? I mean, that's fun. That would that's be fun. really cool. I yeah, would love that, that. But I'm just saying, if you, if, if you have to place your $100 on whether or not that happens, you put in a Hunsky that he actually comes out of retirement, that's where I'm at with it. Like, if it happens, great. Like, I'm, fuck yeah, that's awesome. But I'm not, like, you know, waiting on it or, you know, counting. You know, I just – I don't think it will. Like, if I had to bet $100 on will it or won't it, I'm I'm slamming the won't button. But it's been gaining steam, the GSP Khabib fight. Our, our boy Nick Gaines, he, he posted something about it the other day on social media that some, some little source said that it was happening. But – I don't know. I'll believe it when I see it. I'm, I feel I'm, like I, I feel like GSP after seeing the damage to Connor's legacy from the, the troll fans in this fight against Poirier, 
I think that that was enough to show him like I'm not coming back to the sport. Like his legacy right now is is a Mount Rushmore guy. Like he's probably a top four guy GSP, right? Ah, uh, maybe. Probably top ten for sure, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's probably top four because most of the casuals that love the sport back in the old days are going to keep him there with, like, Anderson Silva. But it's hard to say that Khabib wouldn't have a place there. John Jones obviously has a place there. And then it's like, yeah. does Stipe or DC? Well, it's about to, uh, that's what I have to say. From the argument... Yeah, GSP, GSP versus Khabib. Khabib. That, and that's yeah, the yeah, only yeah. fight he comes back for. If, if those two guys fight, they're both retired. They both fight. They're both yeah. considered the greatest of their era. I'm cool with that. And I, yeah, I'm cool with it, but uh, yeah, no, exactly. If it happens, that's what it's gonna be. Um, but yeah, man, we'll we'll dive into this Alexandre uh, Pantoja versus M- Manel Cop fight. Um, it was a coin flip, uh, minus one ten for both guys. Is that what dodge you had? Yeah, I love yeah. pickums. Love pickums. Yeah, I mean, who from a pre-fight <laughs> standpoint? I mean, it literally doesn't get any better. It's hard to get hyped for like a plus eight hundred. You know what I'm saying? Um, money, money. Now, what does – now, this is at 125. What does old rankings McGee and you think about this? Debut versus number five? No, that's why I was so perplexed, and I need you to make it make sense for me, bro. Like, the rankings McGee and me was like fucking C-3PO does not compute. It fucking hurt my head. I uh, But, like I said, I don't know shit about Coppa, and I'm willing to admit that. So, like, like knowing what you know, which is more than me, did it make sense for you? Or, like, am I tripping being too much of a ranking uh, McGee? I th- like, what's I, up with that? Personally, I thought they went way too big, way too fast. Like, he deserves someone yeah. that was around, like, 8 or 9 or 10. I thought it was disrespectful to Pantoja to do this. But I also thought it was a test of Pantoja to do this because Pantoja has been showing in his last two or three fights that he just wants to get in there and trade and, like, be entertaining. And while that's all well and good, you can't get rocked every fight and because the UFC can't depend on you in the moments they need to depend on you because you might get, like, upset. So this is almost like a, hey, Alexandre, Prove it to us. And this is also like for Manel Cop. He is a dude coming from a uh, Filipino fight league where he was a champion, but they wore shoes. So already very weird. And they could yeah. do like head kicks on the ground, okay. shoes on, like brutal. And then he went and fought in Russia's fight league for his last two or three fights. Uh, and now has come here since. So okay. he has like this very legit skill set. And they were aware of what they were getting. But it's almost like way too much, way too fast. Like even Prohaska, they gave him Ozdemir when Ozdemir was ranked number eight. Yeah, you know what man, I mean? It's like I feel like it maybe have to do with the fact that it's the flyweight division. Like I feel like this doesn't yeah. happen in bantamweight. It doesn't happen in featherweight. It doesn't happen in lightweight. No way in fucking hell. But the flyweight is somewhat of a thinner division, and they are always looking for that next flyweight. Um, I I get it. Like I said, I just. And I, they were kind of in a win-win because if he loses, they're like, oh, well, it was his debut versus the top five. Are you going to hold that against him? You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, right. So because now everyone's of, like, and it's not like Cop had a terrible showing. He just needs more activity, man. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I, and as far as the testing Pantoja angle of it, I get what you're saying because Pantoja is so not explosive and so not, like, scary, quote-unquote, that it's like, how does he do against an explosive, scary guy? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, like, okay, so how did you score the first round? Because that oh, was I probably the closest I thought it got. Nah. Yeah, I mean, the third I round was 10, close. 10 9 Pantoja. I mean, he almost like quadrupled his volume and he controlled the center of the octagon. Like, I thought it was a no brainer. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that whenever I watched the eye test, I was like, ah, oh, very active, a lot of feints. And I kept thinking to myself, like, Cop needs to actually throw something, though. Like, he needs yeah. to quit fainting and throw it. And then when they showed the numbers and it was, like, 34 strikes to, like, what, like, 12 strikes landed or something like that, I was like, oh, well, this wasn't even close. Like, this was obviously Pantoja's around. It was just a weird, like, visual. Yeah, no, I agree. And, yeah, Cope just reminded me of a guy who just, like, like, dog, you've been, like, shadow boxing too much. Or, like, you've been, like, like you said, activity maybe. It's just, like, like you need to, like, fight how an actual fight happens and you know what i'm saying like it's like oh, yeah. he, he looks great from like looking crisp and athletic and if you're in the gym in shorts i'm sure that looks phenomenal but in the octagon like who gives a shit dog you're getting lapped you think that had to do with like ufc lights like him not expecting the 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 moment to be as big as it actually was i'll be real with no fans i'm not giving anybody a lights pass fair, <laughs> that's fair, fair. unfair now, what I'm interested to see whenever fans get back in, 
these guys where it's not even their debut. By then, it may be, they may have three or four UFC fights. But, but they're they like, what fought, is this? Yeah, they've never fought in front of 40,000 people. That's what's going to be fucking interesting and add a whole wrinkle of storylines whenever we get to that point. That's a great point because uh, last night, Zalal was talking to Mark Montoya at points during his fight. Like, was saying, like, yeah, yeah, I know I got it. Or, yeah, I'm going for it. Like, I, which is crazy. Never do that, by the yeah. way. Like, don't have a conversation where, where your opponent can hear everything that's being said. That can't be a good idea. But, um, yeah, you can't do that when there's enough fans that they're yelling. You can't you – could, you couldn't have that correspondence. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, they said not that you should, but you couldn't have it. Exactly. It takes that option off the table. Um, round two, I scored 10-9 Pantoja. Once again, volume. He threw more. And, but it wasn't just quantity. It was quality. He landed cleaner. I thought he landed pretty damn clean in round two. Yeah, I honestly uh, landed nice body kicks too. And it had a nice, like, they both had a nice flurry to end the round. Yes. Which was about Cape's or Cap's brightest point in that round. Well, and and another thing that just leaped off the screen was that Pantoja was mixing up his strikes beautifully. Leg kicks, body kicks, punches, maybe even a few head kicks. But uh, he was mixing it up. Cape, I don't even know if he threw a kick. Like, he was only hands. Probably only low kicks. I never saw him go high with a kick. Yeah, which I mean, which essentially the, allows Pantoja to be way more active with his hands because he doesn't have to keep a guard. He can literally just keep throwing. And I got to say, when I say Pantoja lands clean, it kind of needs the air quotes for the simple fact that, like, when Pantoja has, like, zero power, zero explosivity, like, I understand why the UFC kind of doesn't like him being ranked top five. Like, he's a good fighter, but he's not a scary fighter. And I'm not saying scary right. like he wouldn't beat me up. I'm just saying scary like, skill sets that like you know present real danger to the person he's fighting like like figurito you're like taking a risk when you go and i know he's a champ that's like a he's a rare freak but even guys like garbrandt will hurt you um and, and i know he's banned some weight but i'm just saying uh like roy val roy val hurt you i've seen yeah. roy val land like clean on guys and hurt him or, or even like moreno's scary in a different perspective of like he just he swarms and smothers he's zombie, yeah when he's a zombie he just doesn't die we he showed that in his life in his, his title fight he just like that's a scary guy to fight a guy that just doesn't stop or quit or it just has a chin, uh, iron chin like that's scary in its own right like pantos is not scary like and like, i will like, say, he has a good chin for 25 but it's like when you don't have any other lightning skill set just having a chin isn't that awesome when it's like, it's, I don't even want to say he doesn't have the right skill set because, like, his striking is, like, technically gorgeous and really his volume and his cardio, like, he, but it's just, it's not, like, deadly. It's not, well, and like, at it, like, it, 25, like, DC made this point last night when he was talking about a guy, Nick Piccanini, who is an all American wrestler from OSU that's now training out there with, like, Crutchmer and a few other guys. Like, dude, they get all the, the badass OSU wrestlers go out there. Uh, George, uh, Jordan Derringer, who is a three-time national champion, is going to go out to AK and start training to fight out there. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, they get ballers out there. But he was telling Piccanini, like, hey, you see these guys like Kyle and, and Braden, like, they fight at big weights, so, like, their skills don't have to be as complete as yours. And he told him, like, the lower your weight, the higher your skill set has to be. Yeah, and I think Pantoja's skill set is high. But we, we've talked about this before on the podcast. There's, like, these two graphs, right? Their skill set graph and like athleticism graph. And the guys like style benders, they cross way up here. Or yeah. guys like Justin James, where we said like the, the athleticism was like down here and the, the graph meets down here at this point. Um, Pantoja's at this weird, he's, he's over here, he's the opposite. His skill is great, but his athletic ability is just like, I don't know, it, it's a weird combination where there's a definitely a ceiling on Pantoja because he just can't put people to sleep. Pantoja's a high floor, low ceiling guy. Yes. High floor, low ceiling. Love that. Yes. I, I completely agree. Um, and, and like I said, so that being said, I gave Pantoja round three as well. He had the head kick and the knee to the head, which I thought, like, it was a, I thought round three was a little closer, but. Uh, super thought, close. Also, super low output. I did not enjoy round three as far as visually watching. And that's what I'm saying. In a round like that, if one guy lands a head kick in and needed the head, he wins the round when there's not a lot going on. And you know, you know what I mean? Like, like if you can land two super significant strikes like that that are hard to land, I feel like that gets you in a round in a low activity round. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I agree. I scored at 30 27. Um, 
Two judges scored at 29-28, which is, I guess, maybe understandable. I don't know. I mean, obviously they gave it to the right guy. I don't know. Like I said, I, I scored 30-27 Pantoja. Sounds like you did as well. I also had 30-27 uh, Pantoja. I wrote, I can see 29-28 for the third round, depending on what you value. Exactly, exactly. And I just, I don't know, man. Like I said, it was a weird fight because Pantoja won. But he beat an unranked fighter. And he, like, didn't look scary. And Cop didn't look league. great. It, it didn't build any stock into your number five fighter. No. That's no. kind of the problem I have with this matchmaking is yeah. that you didn't build your fifth-ranked fighter at all. You didn't give them anything. No, no, I agree. I agree, especially it was a coin flip, and it goes to, and it goes to decision. He didn't finish him. Like, it, it, if, if Pantoja would have finished him, I'd be like, oh, shit, you know what I'm saying? Look out, Brandon Moreno. But, but I <laughs> – like, like honestly, I would have Moreno as like a minus three hundred over Pantoja right now, or even Alex Perez, who's ranked number four. I think Alex Perez like would put the work on Al- Alexandre Pantoja. I'm so glad you brought that up, my friend, because I'm going to tell you, um, flyweights ranked one through four. I got it written down, and tell me, tell me who Pantoja fights next after beating an unranked fighter in a decision. Wait, wait, um, wait, wait. Let me see. So it's Moreno at one. You have uh, the old guy that no one likes at three. Uh, what's his name? He's married to Megan O'Levy. He's uh, he just got he's lost Figueredo twice. Benavidez is two. Yes, Joseph Benavidez. He's two. Okay, and then four is Alex Perez. Who's at three? Who's at th- who's at three? Askar Askarov. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the, the, got the, him. The, the the demon conjurer. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah, we got Moreno at one, Benavidez at two, Askarov at three, and Perez at four. And like. Honestly, I'm cool with two through four, honestly. Like, because Perez is coming off a loss, uh, but he's coming off a loss to Moreno, right? To, uh, to Figueredo. Figueredo. Yeah, because he got the title shot over Moreno. That's what happened. So, I don't I don't mind um, getting Alex, Alex Perez next. And I'll be real. I don't know. Educate me on Askarov if you can. I don't really know much yeah. about him. Yeah. So, Askar Askarov, you'll remember him as soon as I bring this up. He's the guy that's 90% deaf, can barely hear whenever he's in the mm. fight. But he's the super skilled grappler. Okay. Um, he is undefeated, I believe, eleven and zero or eleven zero and one. No, yeah, it's a it's a small record. I remember that it was like twelve and one. I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, super super skilled guy doesn't have a lot of power, but has maybe more grappling technique than anyone else in the top five. Uh, okay. Moreno would give him a run. That'd be a fun fight. But obviously Moreno has to fight Figueredo again because of the split draw. So I think Benavidez should get Askar Askarov to see who fights next to the title. And I think Alex Perez should fight Alejandro Pantoja Benavidez. because – Oh, oh yeah. you're saying – you're saying, I'm sorry. You're saying – say that all. I'm saying – okay, so I'm saying two should fight three and four should fight five. So Benavidez, Askarov, and then yeah. Perez, Pantoja? Mm-hmm. Cause, because okay, Perez fair, just I mean, lost to the champion. So, like, he needs to solidify his fourth ranking. Alejandre just won at five against one unranked. Doesn't really solidify his ranking. So it's going to tell us a lot about four and five to see them compete against each other, actually. I love the logic there. Um, my own little spiciness I'll throw in is that I think I want to see Pantoja versus Benavidez for the reason that Benavidez is – I have a problem with a guy coming off two losses that's ranked two. I don't like that. I Maybe that's I like, a I agree with problem. that, too. I agree with that, too. Um, Benavidez is way overrated. Way overrated. And so what I'm saying is it presents you in a cool thing as far as moving forward. Because you can – essentially, if Pantoja beats Benavidez, then it's like, okay, you're a real top fiver. Like, you may not be my favorite top fiver, but you've earned, well established your place in the top five of the division. Now, and then if Benavidez beats Pantoja, you kind of get a get rid of Pantoja out of your top five, and you kind of validate – your original stance of having Benavidez as two, and it kind of makes you look good. Um, so I don't know, but that's that's the only a different angle I'll throw in there. I, I wouldn't mind seeing Pantoja Benavidez, but logic wise, I 100% agree kind of where you're coming from. Mine's kind of more of a in principle type of thing. Oh, I also think that I think the UFC might be done with Joey Benavidez, man. He makes a lot of money per fight, hasn't really been showing up in division there, not wanting to put a lot of money into. So yeah. I think it makes sense given this young lion. And here's the reason that I say Askarov needs to fight up. Askarov's the next guy to get the shot. It's, okay. I mean, he just is, right? Because Benavidez lost. Askarov Perez Marino. lost. 
Mor yeah, correct. Moreno is either going to win or Askarov lose. Askarov is the Sanhagen of the flyweight division. Yeah, he's the guy just waiting for his shot. So it's almost like, well, you can kill two birds, one stone probably. And like with Frankie Edgar, just get him out essentially with this young up-and-comer. Clear that name out. We don't have to worry about it now. And now it's guaranteed like he gets the next shot. Yeah, for sure, because a bit of Vito's fucked around and beat Pantoja, which could totally happen. That's my uh, problem, is yeah. that that solidifies him to stay there and then yeah. get another title shot, fight for it for a fifth time. I'm Absolutely. done with Benavidez, man. Done That's with him. Fair. Love him. Done with Super him. Super fair. And lightweight bladder McGee strikes again. I'll be back, bro. I don't know if you want to introduce or talk shit about flyweight. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no. I'm just throwing you under the bus. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so... Dominic, uh, we had been talking about this next fight coming up, which is uh, Michael Johnson and Clay Guida. Um, now, for people that aren't aware, Michael Johnson comes in this fight with a 20-16 and 16 record. That is a salty record. And then Clay Guida comes in with like a 29 and like 20 record. Like, both these guys' records are just unbelievably bad to be in the UFC. Now, in their defense, they both fought in the UFC for – eight years plus Guida since 06. I think Michael Johnson made his first appearance in 2011, 2012. He does hold a win over Dustin Poirier. Um, so both these guys have like some legit backgrounds, but this is also one of those fights where the UFC is kind of trying to move on from their older guys, which, uh, which Dana White has covered multiple times that there's gonna be a lot of cuts coming to uh, the UFC's like, older guys essentially like they're trying to get these old get these guys, old guys, out, guys of here. out of so, here so this is one of those fights where it's essentially like who gets to stay and who has to leave this is like a loser leaves town kind of a fight to me i'm, I'm glad you brought that up and i i, I just I'm, I'm while you're, I, what you're putting down yeah no i just gave a quick rundown of michael johnson's record clay guida's record why they're each such terrible records and how they're still in the ufc and then that's yeah. how i got to the loser leaves town for sure. And uh, shout out uh, Mama Life who's watching that, another fellow podcaster. I always love getting nice. support from fellow podcasters. I appreciate you. I support what you're doing as well. Um, you know, go follow her at Mama Life with a Y plus three if, if you're interested in, like, mom, you know, parenting type podcasts. She, she does good stuff. But, um, but yeah, Michael Johnson versus Clay Guida, 100%. This was an elimination fight, almost like tournament style. Losers done. Um yeah, because what both are coming off. I think Johnson was coming off a four fight skid, and is Guida is Guida coming off a win? Or, or uh, he's coming off a win, but it was one of those ones where it was like I cannot believe Clay Guida got this victory. Uh, yeah, Bobby Green, yeah. I believe it was. Did and, he beat Bobby Green? Yeah, not Rico. <laughs> yeah, that's what, because he just did the exact same thing that he did to Michael Johnson. This is one of the ones I I bet Clay Guida to win this fight. A plus 180 underdog, Michael Johnson, minus 210. Reason being, Clay Guida is just going to hang on to your body and pull you to the mat. What does Michael Johnson yeah. struggle with? Anyone close to him. Yeah, man, and it's, I, I, I saw so many people. I'm sure you won't find them out there claiming it now, but on Twitter, everybody, I think Sean O'Malley had Michael Johnson winning. Oh, yeah, he lot. said, I got MJ. Yeah, yeah I saw it. Lot, I saw it. Of, <laughs> yeah, Sugar Sean, but uh, a lot of fighters, a lot of MMA talking heads, a lot of sports bettors were liking Michael Johnson. And it's easy to like an athlete like Michael Johnson against an old guy like Clay Guida until they get in the octagon. It's one of those things, right, where, like, you can talk yourself into it beforehand, but once they're in there, you're like, oh, yeah, this is a fight, and Guida is a fighter. This isn't a – Yeah, combat. right. You know? Yeah, exactly right. Like, Michael Johnson probably has incredible measurables. And honestly, whenever he was a younger man, had, like – insanely fast hands and big time power but he's also has a ton of mma miles just like clay clay guida but what you'll note about guida guida's style is that his style can prolong fights and win fights whenever you're super old and lose that speed whereas michael johnson's cannot do that oh, and frankie Ed, once again frankie edgar good example of that you like frankie edgar's style of like wrestling getting in close that allows him to edge out those rounds against guys that are still younger and faster. Yep. Yep, yeah, for sure, man. Um, yeah, Guida, I mean, when I say Guida looked good, it's got to be like its own separate category of looking good. Because it doesn't look good. It looks good in the sense of like building the frame of a house. 
You can't see it, but it structurally is very sound. <laughs> exactly. It's not going to win you any uh, Home and Garden magazine covers, but, uh, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, the tornado might not rock you, though, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. And, um, yeah, man, so, I, I mean, I scored a 30-27 Guida. Um, yeah, I thought me too. Round one, like you mentioned earlier, was kind of confusing because Guida was winning the round, but he also has a cut on his head. But an old – guy like that like Guida I mean he's gonna bleed if you look at him too hard so like with certain veteran <laughs> fighters like that you know you kind of gotta take the blood with a grain of salt you can't factor it in as like damage uh, yeah and it's and that's the thing is like it takes minimalistic damage to open that cut because it's such scarred tissue yeah so it's almost like I don't even score it as damn it's like Nate Diaz like I just expect him to be a bloody mess and it almost works in their favor of the sense of like Clay, Clay Guida can get like his face beat off the canvas and i'll still be like we might get a takedown here oh yeah 100 yeah, percent, 100 percent, man yeah it, but once again it ain't over till the fat lady sees him clay, uh, clay guida um but yeah man in round one uh, guida did take more of a striking approach throwing them big signature looping ugly ass hands i've uh, landed some big right hands um and like i said I, I wrote in my notes don't put much stock into the blood because that's it's clay guida uh, <laughs> But, yeah, and then round two, had a 10-9 Guida. That's whenever he started to transition to more of the grappling approach, which proved yep. to be very effective and just zapped the energy right out of Michael Johnson, which Michael Johnson, I believe, has had gas tank issues in the past. So pretty sound strategy there. Now, I will say Michael Johnson, he's the other factory X guy I was thinking of. That So oh. Yusuf Salal, terrible execution of game plan. Michael Johnson, terrible execution of game plan. Mark Montoya needs to do better. Now, here's my point in which he did do better, which is he told Michael Johnson, hey, you didn't win first or second round. You have to finish him if you want to win this fight going into the third, right? Well, he came out swinging for the fences, got him rocked, and then immediately got taken down. Yep. So good on him for trying, but, like, yeah. you've got to be more present than that. Yeah, it's just, like, it's, it's hard to give a veteran like Michael Johnson – passes for having these massive holes in their game you know yeah, like he's it's 20 like, and 17 as his fight record now yeah and it's like you've had ample opportunity to improve upon these areas and he said it yeah. himself. these are his words not mine that he like you know likes to party and uh, some parts of his career gotten less focused and it's like well I, like that ain't on me dog like i mean that's not like me <laughs> like like, like you didn't go about things the right way, you know what I'm saying? And, and the results showed up in the octagon and really can be summed up in about that, um, you know. And, and, like, even Clay Guida, he said whenever he got distracted, it wasn't from partying, it was from fishing too much. And so if you think a guy that parties too much and a guy who fishes too much, I bet the guy who fishes too much is probably better off. Dude, his post-fight interview where he goes, yeah, I'm just going to get back on the boat. Reel a couple in and uh, take my time and see what's next. And it's just like, oh my god, dude! Like he's just a he's just a fighter, fighter's fighter. He's a competitor because he said after he retires, he wants to be like a pro fisherman. And like those. Oh, did he say that? I missed that. Yeah. yeah no. Oh, like, totally that's tight. See, I can totally see. Did you guys play? Slow Dave on ESPN in the summertime. Oh, dude. Like the bass tournaments. <laughs> I'll, I would I'll love that. Him. I would watch him. I would watch him I'd for watch sure. Him. And to see him yeah. fight a fish, I bet he'd wreck a fish. <laughs> that would be oh, tremendous, God. dude. Oh, tremendous. Man. Oh, and of course, it's not a Clay Guida fight until his like 1980s scrunchy ponytail comes out. Come, and yeah. And the, yeah, <laughs> well, and then it's like bloody hair in his eyes, too. Always. You can fucking, like, schedule that shit out. That needs to be a prop <laughs> bet. Like, what round does Clay Guida's ponytail come out? That yeah, and then, oh, and then even better, dude, I love that you say that, because then he'll get rocked, and you'll see it, like, move across his face from, like, him getting rocked, like, the hair, like, repositioned. Well, I literally saw the ponytail shoot across the ring last night. I, I literally <laughs> witnessed it. It was like, you know, like, I, it was awesome. Yeah, man. And, like, I got to say, though, all things considered, I was texting you before this fight saying, like, yeah, not stoked for this fight at all. And like, yeah, I know. We, we can be pretty hard on the old guys sometimes. And I think that's what soured me. We watched some shitty old guy fights lately, and it kind of just, like, didn't leave me much hope. And then you're like, oh, no, this might be entertaining. And it did prove to be entertaining. So I kind of got to, you know, I'll, I'll pump my brakes on 
you know, I should have known Clay Guida puts on entertaining fights, win or lose, and I should have given him more credit for that. That's, that's that was my only good. point was that Clay Guida just he comes to literally be carried out on his shield or carried out on like a throne of victory. Yeah. And there's no in between for that man. Yeah, man. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And like I said, I when I was first looking at this main card, I was like, Oh god damn, these type of fights. And then after watching the fight, I'll give the matchmakers their credit. They gave us an entertaining fight. They 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 provided an exciting fight for us, the viewer, to you know oh, watch. Which, by the way, speaking of entertaining, ah, fuck, I almost want to go main event next, but the, we'll do the people's main event next. Yeah. Uh, which, if you want to introduce it, I'm gonna grab something while you introduce them because I, oh, I'll be right back. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, for sure, brother. Um, so we have the co-main event, which. Anybody looking at this fight leading up to this, like it just looked out of place. Like just if you're talking eye test and who should be fighting who and what fight should be the co-main, I, I was just saying how when you looked at this card, it just looked out of place having this fight as the co-main. Like, made no just, sense to me. He just, just had, Sandhagen just headlined a, a, a fight night and and literally knocked the guy's block off who was in the top five in rankings. In highlight fashion, yeah. It made no sense to me. And honestly, these guys were higher ranked than Overeem or Volkov. Yeah, no, it, uh, it just didn't pass the smell test. It didn't pass the sniff test. I thought it was bad marketing. I guess, though, I guess if you're trying to get viewers and market and pick two guys' face to put on the poster, I think, well, I don't know, because Frankie Edgar, but I think maybe q No, o Overeem is Overeem, like... That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like to and and then and then Volkov, you get all the all the Europeans. The Russians. So so. Which shout out to Volkov's back piece, both of them, the Stingray and now the Samurai helmet. Whack that he got rid of the Stingray because the Stingray was dope as fuck in my opinion. Oh, that's so hilarious! You just settled like an argument between me and Nina. Me and Nina was like, why we were watching the like hype video. And she was like, oh, I like his Stingray back piece. And I was like, oh, no, babe, that's a Samurai head. Like, that's not a Stingray. That's so hilarious. He's he covered his Stingray with the Samurai helmet. And so now when okay. you look at it, the nose, the bridge of the nose of the, of the helmet is the tail of the Stingray. And then up on the Stingray is where, like, the horns come off, and you can't really see it. He did some okay. great cover job. Okay. Oh, my God, bro. So uh, uh, Nina's going to be thrilled to hear that she, she kind of was right there. And then uh, – yeah, and uh, also, I've been watching hella Miami Ink. Like, I know, like, that's what's Dude, he's so got random. good ink! Dude, like, Ami James and Chris Garver would be proud of that Japanese back piece. For Thank sure. you. And it looks yeah. like he... I bet You know what? I bet he actually got it in Japan, being a Russian. That's not a far trip. Yeah, maybe. Maybe there's some training over there. Um, a lot of guys, you know, go to the well, Asian training. And, well, in the Ryzen Fight League, fights out of Japan, oh, which he used that. to fight in. That's dope. Yeah, that's, yeah I, I love this tattoo. Like I said, that's interesting because me and my wife were like, is that a stingray? Or she was saying it was a stingray, and I was saying it was a samurai. And we're kind of both right. But You're both right. There, right. there is a stingray hidden in the samurai helmet. And I think she saw like an old clip. like you know. I was yes, saying, so, because they show him like beating old fighters with his stingray. Yeah, yeah It's yeah, his only so, tattoo, by the way. He doesn't have any other tattoos. Yeah, ballsy. Ballsy. <laughs> yeah. Because, as a yeah. guy. Because I have a lot of tattoos. But, like, I'm not a type of person that say tattoos don't hurt. Like, I'm a pussy at getting tattooed. And, uh, and no, tattoos hurt like a motherfucker. Yeah. So have, have your first one be a back piece. I mean, kudos to you. Especially, like, um, down your spine and stuff, too. But, sorry, I completely distracted us from the people's main event. It's all, it's all good, man. I, this was a great co-main. Probably the best co-main you're ever going to find, honestly. Um, I don't know. Uh, Chandler Hooker was pretty amazing. But uh, right. I mean, these were equally amazing in the exact same right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great point. Um, so we had number two, Corey the Sandman Sanhagen, a minus three sixty favorite, coming off of his gorgeous wheel kick knockout of uh, Marlon Moraes, and um, he was fighting Fra the legend Frankie Edgar, uh, who was still ranked four after all this time in the bantamweight division, and uh, plus three hundred. And man, Frankie Edgar's been at it so long. He's been at it before they even had a bantamweight division, which is that's crazy. right. That's it's, right. It's wild, man. He's been he. It's so wild to think of him fighting at fifty five, and he's like what five six or something. That's wild. Man. Yeah, yeah. And he fought like he used to be like a muscle hamster would be in like wars at fifty five. Yeah, yeah, man. Fought, just, fought like, for the belt at fifty five. Was the champion at forty five? Yes, 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 man. Uh, so former champion, you know, Frankie Edgar. And I'm heaping all this praise upon his name because what happens next, I don't want to sound disrespectful. <laughs> I mean, even, even Corey Sandhagen didn't enjoy seeing the results. 
like played yes. back to him. Yeah, and like I said, if you've been on Instagram or Twitter in the past 18 hours, then you've seen the viral highlight, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Flying the, I think it was like 29 seconds or something uh, like 27, that. 27, 27 27. Okay, yeah, 27 second flying the um, – Shades of Askren Masvidal, but I mean, I'll, I'll put, I'll give this one all day just over level of opponent and also just like he set it up. He set a trap. Like they were breaking it down afterwards. Cruz was, and I know I've kind of been harsh on Cruz, but he did a great job breaking that down because it's so easy to write off a 30 second flying knee knockout as some fluky thing. But then whenever Cruz broke it down and how he like kind of like corralled him into range and it was all kind of planned. It, oh. it, it just – it makes it that much more crazy. You know what I want to note for Corey Sandhagen is he said in his last three or four fights, since the Aljo fight, he started doing this, like, military-style simulation training and thinking that, like, every time he's going into the gym, he, like, meditates before it, and then he visualizes himself every technique he works going against his opponent's defense. So that wow. he almost is in, like, this flow state when he enters the fight where he's like, I already know what they're going to do. I've already simulated everything they can do. Man, you want to talk about, like, game face? And I don't mean a looking scary game face. I mean, I'm talking about being locked the fuck. That's what I mean. Like, he seemed like he was flow state from the minute he entered the cage last night. Well, so I don't know if you heard this little post-fight thing from Bisping. But Bisping, he was talking about the he, – he just went over, like, it was right before – I think um, Sam Hagen was getting his wrist wrapped, his hands wrapped. Um, it, it, it was kind of in that pre-fight stage not too long before he went out. And Bisping said that he was walking by him and he was like sending him well wishes, you know, hey man, I'm a bit, you know, I, I like what you're doing. Go, go knock him dead or whatever kind of shit one fighter says to another as they're walking yeah. by him pre-fight. And, and he said, St. Hagen looked at him like he wanted to kill me. Like from Bisping, he's like, he's like, he said, he looked at me like he wanted to kill me. And I just thought that he didn't like me very much. And he was just, he, but then I, he's like, I went and saw how he performed and he was like, no, he was just, like in the fucking zone, but yeah, locked in. Yeah, Bisping said before the fight, like you know, thirty twenty minutes before, thirty minutes before, he like walked by him and was like trying to like you know give him good vibes, and he just was like he said he said Hagen looked at him like he wanted to kill him. <laughs> I mean, fucking. he damn near did kill Frank Yeager. So flying knee, walk off KO. When I say walk off, like literally hits it, turns and sees him like slumped on the ground, just and just strolls casually. And then just starts going, I want the belt. I want the belt. And in his post-fight interview, I loved what he said. Fuck yeah. Peter Yan. And I hate to just be that brutal about it. But Piotr Yan saying that he wants to fight Dillashaw next. Yeah, that's, that's garbage. That's trash. Dillashaw doesn't yeah. even get to fight for, for a belt that quick, in my opinion. No, thank you, bro. And I've been honestly like in a few little arguments and shit in comment sections over this exact subject. And I feel the exact same way as you. And, um, is, you know, a lot of people out there think Dillashaw does deserve to, like, get a title shot. Or, you know, he's, he's in, in one of the best bantamweights in the world, which he is one of the best bantamweights in the world. But to just jump him over these guys that have been as active and as dominant as Sanhagen. And, like, yeah, Sanhagen got choked out by Aljo. But you know something I like? And it's it's sportsmanship in a different kind of way. It's not the Darius Felder sportsmanship. It's the competitive, like – playful jabs competitive like like some some kobe type of sportsmanship or like between sanhagen and aljo they both yes, like yes. speak of each other really respectively like um i think that well, my airpods dying but um i did i i can keep going i can keep going. cool yeah yeah um you can hear me good yeah oh yeah all right cool um so um yeah, so, so Sanhagen and Aljo, they never speak disrespectfully of each other, even though they have this, like, super competitive rivalry. And, like, but they do it in not, like, a friendly, like, Ned Flanders way. They do it in, like, a, oh, like, I'll fuck you up, but that, that's yeah. a good, good fighter right there. Like, I respect that man, but I'll beat him. Like, I love – they both speak about each other in the exact same light. Yeah, I really – I just – it raises a level of respect. And then beyond that, too, like – I just think that Sandhagen in his last two fights, like knocking out Marais the way he did and then knocking out Frank Yeager the way he did, there's no, there's no question that it's title or nothing. Title or nothing, yeah. And it isn't, he almost finds himself in the exact same situation that Engano found himself in where he's just kind of waiting for that title shot. He's like, there's no other fight to make, but 
the Aljo Yon fight is already scheduled, and we already know there's usually like a six month gap between title like defenses. Um, yeah, and, and then you the fact that him and Aljo have already fought. There's so many fun storylines in this, and I love that like him and Aljo both agree with each other, and I'll throw myself in there that uh, Aljo's gonna beat Yon. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I like. Yeah, I like how Corey Sanhagen was like he's talking about fighting Dillashaw next, and he was like. That's if he even wins. Yeah, I love that he said that because that's been my thought, man. Because, you know, I, I follow all the MMA pages and all that, and everybody's been saying, like, oh, yeah, like, Yon has his eyes on Dillashaw. It's like, hey, like, you've already, in my opinion, you've already lost the Sterling fight if you're looking past him. You can't look past Aljamain Sterling. A Aljo's a monster. The human backpack. Anybody that's played any sport has ever had a coach tell him, like, you know, it's one week at a time. It's the next opponent. Like, you can't look ahead on the schedule and count wins and losses. You just can't in any sport, but much less mixed martial arts at the highest level, the bantamweight, which is probably the most stacked division, probably besides lightweight. And um, and, and just, just to overlook a guy like Aljamain Sterling when he's a grappler and you're a boxer? I mean, it's literally what? like like it's literally what gambling sharps refer to as, like, look-ahead weeks. Like, in, in – in college football, NFL, like when you know that you have like probably the biggest game of your season coming up in two weeks, the game before it is not treated as important as it should be. Like if you're playing the Jets this week, but you got the Chiefs next week, a lot of guys on the roster are going to be like, oh, like what about like how we stop my homes? And uh, yeah, but but imagine if the Jets were another real like were the were the Buccaneers. It's like looking past the Buccaneers because to to look forward to the Chiefs because like Aljamain Sterling. Like I said, and it's one thing if it was another boxer that he was looking past, but right. I both Aljamain Sterling and Sandhagen, both of them, stylistically present massive problems for Jan. Yeah, oh, I, Jan wants nothing to do with the styles. He avoided the Sterling fight for as long as he possibly could, if you ask yes. me. And I think Aljo shows that he has that he knows that as well because he keeps talking about. Like, if Yon needs to fight me, Yon needs to fight me. When's this fool going to fight me? And then I think that if you asked Aljo, like, hey, if you were to become champion, like, would you be open to fighting Sandhagen again? I think he would say Sandhagen deserves first shot. ASAP. I think he would even go a step further and say, ASAP, we can do it three months after the Yon fight. Right, right, right. Yeah. And Aljo's you just know, that super game New Yorker, too. Like, that's his personality. Yeah, man, and like I don't know, Jan is a super unlikable champion. Like, like I, the least man, likable. I think he had a pretty like I know it's controversial to say Aldo's an easy path to a belt, but I'm gonna say that. Like, disagree with my take or not? Like, I feel you. He, he, like, I just I'm not taking away from his career as a whole, but at that moment in time, that was a pretty goddamn easy championship fight for Jan. I, I well, hey, say what you will. Hundred percent um, agree. Hundred percent agree. And yeah, man, Aljo. Because we all agree, Aljo would pro would be Aldo. I mean, most likely nine times out of ten. So like, I just yeah, man, for Yon to like kind of get a fluky belt and then to like kind of run from defending the belt and like, but he still likes to like talk shit online to Aljo. Like they'll get in back and forth. Yeah, but, like, I know. He has no high ground to stand on as far as talking back and forth with Aljo. So it's weird. That's I do not like, you know, I, I really, really hope, and I think most MMA fans or UFC fans would agree with me, is that I, I think we all, most of us, unless you're from Russia, probably want Aljo to take the belt from Jan and then for Aljo Sanhagen to take place in like six months. I think yeah. that's like a perfect world. Yeah, like I think looking at it, how it lays out, like we might get to see an Aljo fight uh, Sandhagen in International Fight Week first week of July. Ooh, that'd be that'd be amazing. Yeah, that's best case scenario. I just Sandhagen too, man. He has like this mean streak in him. Like an always post fight. I mean, he was like aggressive, like 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 dangerous. Like like how Baker Mayfield, like, he was kind of trolling when he said it. But yeah, I woke up feeling dangerous. Like Sandhagen's walking around feeling like he's the most dangerous bantamweight in the world. And I think that's not to be like understated like it kind of reminds me of like connor on the rise just that level of confidence like i'm gonna hurt this man like yeah I don't know, like, or like personal belief in their own skill set too yes yeah man and like i mean it's so tough to predict san hagen aljo too 
It's so – because, I mean, we, I think San Hagen said, and I think we all agree San Hagen's much better than when they fought, even though it hasn't been that long. Um, he, he's he, – he's, and just the confidence and the mental belief in his own ability has grown. The mindset as, change is, like, where I'm just blown away at. It's the same thing as Ortega. That's what we talked about last night uh, was that, like, him and Ortega have entered this, like, own mindset they have where they're untouchable. And then they are untouchable, but due to that, and it's, like, it's beautiful. And if Connor, if the Connor Poirier fight, what did that teach us, class? What did that teach us, class? What is what is the takeaway <laughs> from the Connor uh, McGregor Poirier fight? Ring rust is real, and activity matters. Absolutely. Dan Hagen has been way more active than Alja. Yeah, and also Jan hasn't even been hardly that active aside from all that. When did Jan fight for the for the belt? It was back in what uh, August. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, sounds good to me. I mean, we're yeah, we're talking about eight months. Peter, Peter Young will not have fought a top tier opponent. Yeah, man, and um, yeah. So, I, I think activity wise, I mean, that definitely gives San Hagen the the you know confidence boost or whatever you want to call it over probably both Aljo and Young. In my humble opinion. Yeah, I agree completely. I for me, I think the the telltale message of this fight is. Frankie might be time to hang it up. I don't know. We'll see. Unless, I mean, there's just no point to damage your legacy. And then for Sandhagen, don't take a fight until it's, a, it's, until it's for a belt because you don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I think everybody and their mom is in agreement on that. Like, there's no – it's rare that there's, like, zero controversy in the MMA community. And, like, I think that's one we can get pretty unanimous decision on. Uh, you know, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, also, just just, yeah, one last little thing. You know, as far as Frankie Edgar, I know it's, it takes two to t- tango. And we spent this whole time. We probably spent more time talking about Jan and Aljo than we did either San Hagen or Edgar. But that's just that's how it goes. With for San Hagen, Hagen, it's part of the story. For Edgar, yeah. it's it's the sad truth. Yeah, and then with Edgar, it, it just depends what he wants, man. And like, and, and I, my view is slowly shifting on this. I, I used to just be like, you're old and you get knocked out, you're done. You're like, just deuces um it just depends what role he sees for himself because that's where you don't like to see it like you don't like to see a guy who thinks he still has a run in him but he clearly does it but right there's guys like guida and there's guys like there's other veterans that are just like you know i i, I love this i this is part of who i am I know I'm not what I once was, but I'm still be a tough out for any motherfucker that wants to try me. And I'm starting to look at that differently. Now, now when guys, you know, it's just like they're getting knocked out every single fight. Like, like if, if Edgar took another knockout like that severe, obviously it would be time. But I just – or if Edgar still has – title shot aspirations then it's time but if edgar is just like i'm a fighter i want to fight because that's what i do i'm not going to tell that man to retire but if, if if he's like being delusional and thinking that he just got caught and that he still has a run left in him and that he could beat you know san hagen in a rematch or el joe or yawn or any of those top flight guys you know what i wouldn't mind seeing is an old man bout between aldo and Edgar both coming off logic. Losses. That would not be terrible. That would not be Trying terrible. Trying to decide who still, you know. I think that's a really, really great point to bring up because, like, in the next fight, like, Overeem has referenced the fact that, like, should he lose in this run that he's making, he's done in the UFC. He, he will accept that the UFC belt cannot be attained and he will leave. Not necessarily leave the organization, but will no longer seek to attain the belt in the organization. Yeah, yeah. So... And that's the mindset in which you lose, probably time to hang it up. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess that is a good transition. Yes, Because sir. our main event is Alexander Volkov, number six, minus 190 favorite, versus number five, Alistair Overeem, plus 170, the Demolition Man. I love that nickname. Yeah. Um, and Drago yeah, for Volkov. To be honest, man. Yeah, I me mean, too. Me too. Uh, super lovable guy. Had so many opportunities to capture UFC gold, just never could do it. Um, and honestly, his fight style has changed so much from old Overeem to nowadays Overeem. 
which is what disappointed me in his strategy approach. We'll get to I that. know it. Yes. I know it. That's exactly what I was going to say. Is yes. The way strategy approached this fight was pure trash. Like yeah, the way bro. he fought Augusto Sakai was masterful. Him and Zalal need to like trade game plans. But <laughs> honestly, man, because like Overeem was just getting peace from the outside and refused to get close, and then would try to go with like this high guard shell and throw wild hooks out of it, like he was going to sleep Volkov with one shot. It's like Volkov has a pretty damn good chin. I don't know if people remember, but Derek Lewis, my balls is hot, is who Volkov got knocked out by. That's that same fight. But Volkov ate that full overhand right on the chin and wasn't out on the ground. He wasn't yeah. out cold from a Derek Lewis overhand right. Well, and Volkov just, like, size-wise, is one of the largest heavyweights. And now that's a mouth, like, that's a big statement to make. But he literally is one of the largest heavyweights. 6'7", right 6'7", six, seven. Six, seven, 82 six, inch seven and, and thick. And, um, and, and, man, just an absolute monster. Um, you know what? Uh, we got to put the round on the table. We both liked Overeem coming into this fight. Yeah, we absolutely. We both thought Overeem was going to win. But the reason we liked Overeem was we thought he held the, he held the wrestling and grappling advantage. Which just, right. he never brought even into play. I would say it didn't come into play, but that makes it seem like it wasn't his fault. It's his fault because he didn't bring it into play. Um, right. Or like clinch striking even. Like he never even tried to get into a, like a plumber, yeah. like a, a cage clinch. Like, and Volkov was super smart to just keep range. He just knew that, I, I guess he figured it out. Over him doesn't want this smoke at distance. Yeah, man. I think it was towards the end of the first round, um, Volkov busted his nose with, with a stiff right, I believe, down the pipe. And it seemed from that point, and I, I would never question a warrior like Overeem's heart. But and let me, I'm gonna phrase this as a question rather than a statement. You remember the point I'm talking about where he got his nose busted, right? Do you yes, remember that yeah. exact point? Oh yeah. Would you think it's fair to say, after from that point on, Overeem didn't want the smoke? Like he pretty much knew what was up. Yeah, because he couldn't. He couldn't land the strikes that he w was trying to land from his strategy to begin with. And I think that was frustrating him. And then he thought that Volkov was going to throw a bunch of, like, not straight or uppercut style punches. And then Volkov just saw him literally shell his face and was like, well, dude, I'm just going to punch right in between there. Yeah. And it's like in kickboxing, that works because the gloves, right? Like, the gloves are uh, big enough, padded enough. But he hasn't been a kickboxer in forever. It's like he reverted to that kickboxing defense, which makes no sense in mixed martial arts. Well, and I even want to introduce a different little element, which I don't know how many people are talking about, but this is what came to my mind whenever I saw that high shelf defense, um, how that would work much better back in the day. And I didn't bring into account the heavy gloves, but what I brought into account is how fast the stoppages are now. How many times have we seen a fight be stopped when a guy's eating shots in the high shelf? I mean, I, I can't even count on my fingers and toes. I mean, it's probably... It's all the time. Than, it's all yeah, the time. It, so... And, that, and that's not to say that the strategy, just fights get called much quicker now. Like, you eat, like, a six-piece combo that lands all on the gloves, that fight can still be caught, stopped, even though none of those shot, shots landed clean. I thought this fight could have been stopped a, a solid 15 seconds earlier than it was just because Overeem had literally quit intelligently defending. But yeah. Herzog, Herzog was trying to be like, okay, man, it's your last run in the UFC. Like, I'm going to give you every out. It's a fine line. He was walking that line, also balanced with the we don't want to see you just get, destroy yeah. it either. Right, right, right. It's, and it's he, and I think yeah. Herzog did a fucking good job walking that line. Yeah, because it was close. It was like if he had stopped it 15 seconds early, he might have heard like early stoppage. But then you see Volkov land one uppercut down the middle and over him literally drop his hands and just kind of fall down to the ground. And that's when Herzog was like, all right, like, come on. It's, it's, yeah, it's, man, this is it. Like, Oh, it's like maybe this is like MMA blasphemy to say, but just Overeem didn't want it anymore. Like, mm -hmm. he made the decision at the end of round one when his nose got busted. He was like, this he, he was like, fight right there. I, I think he knew, like, this, I'm not going to get this fight. Like, I can't beat his style. I can't get past his guard. And he's just eating me alive. Like, I think he got in his own head. Did, did he even shoot a takedown? Did he shoot one? Yes, he shot one he shot awful, one. awful outside single, like, so fucking bad. Like, DC kind of made fun of him for it. Yeah, bro. Like, like I, I mean, I know he's a kickboxing background, but lately he's shown some good grappling in the, in the past year or two. He's yeah. won some fights based off his ground dominance. And, it's and he, like, 
He typically has incredibly – he has the highest striking accuracy in UFC history of any fighter ever, 76%, and that was not on, on display last it, night. Yeah, man, it's just like if, if you, like, before the fight, just generic fight one-on-one game plan, the the game plan for Overeem was to either get it in the clinch or on the grapple and ground and pound. That was his path to victory. And the, the victory – the path to victory for Volkov was stay on the outside and, and – Keep him on the end of your punches, which is exactly how the fight went. Just Overeem was unable to implement. I see this is where I even struggle to break it down because it's like, was he unable to implement the game plan? Or like, was his game plan to kickbox with Gold Volkov? Because it seemed like his game plan wasn't to grapple and wrestle, which it should have been, in my opinion. I think his game plan was to try and out kickbox him because he was like, I'm a K1 Grand Prix champion. Like, this dude should be able to stand with me. But then he should have immediately reverted to, all right, I need to get on some singles. I need to get clinch strike and going. I need to do these things if this doesn't work. I don't think that was ever a thought in his head, though, in his game plan of, like, if this doesn't work. And then when it didn't work, he was just like, fuck this, man. I don't want this. Yeah. Like, that's kind of how I, I felt those about vibes. it. I got those vibes that he was just like, you know, I don't need the money. I'm, like, it just, it is what it is. I guess it's just. And yeah, it's almost I'm, the realization of, like, has my skill set in striking deteriorated to this point where this kid's going to outstrike me, even though I'm the decorated striker? Yeah, I think maybe it was an ego fight. Maybe he was fighting with his ego, which is hard to give a veteran a pass for. Because, like, just anybody could have told him that he's not going to just beat Volkov in a kickboxing match at this point. I mean, may, like, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't that obvious. I thought it was clear as day. Like, I'm just like, Volkov, he's so long. I mean, he's younger. I mean, there's just I, – I, if you would have told me from the jump, like before the fight, if you had a crystal ball and was like, I won't tell you who wins, but, you know, Volk, uh, Overeem's going to shoot one takedown and not secure any takedowns. Do with this information what you will. I mean, I'm betting the farm, right, on Volkov? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. Like, I think it was a- anyone that's, like, hip to – where MMA is at now and, like, what, what it's evolved into, knew that if Overeem couldn't be a mixed martial artist last night, he had no shot. Yeah, man. And, and, and I just – I was shocked at the lack of attempt of takedowns. Now, if he would have shot for four takedowns and got them all stuffed, and it's just like it is what it is, you know, I my game plan proved ineffective. Like, hey, you know, I can live with that better. This one is sad, weird with me because he just – did it like I, I kind of like Zalal didn't give himself a chance strategy wise in my humble opinion. I thought it was weird too that he took the high shell and that Volkov took no body shots on him. Like Volkov wasn't just trying to exploit his body whenever he was in a high shell, uh, which I thought was very weird. It was almost like over him. He's giving you the opportunity here to shoot in on a takedown. Yeah, uh, very, very, very good points. Um, now, what I want to spend the last you know couple minutes of this podcast discussing with you is what happens next at heavyweight. So six just beat five. Five may or may not retire, but he's out of the conversation as far as title goes. Um, so we have Volkov at six. Like I said, just beat five. So, I mean, if you want to call him five, by all means, go ahead. Um, and then the top four right now at heavyweight are in Ganu one, which he already has a fight scheduled with Stipe. That's okay. what makes this fun because so many of these guys have five skills. Hold on, let me um, see if I can let me see if I can do this one too. So, so all right, so Stipe's champ and Ganu's one, two is going to be uh, Curtis Blades, three is going to be Derek Lewis, and four is Jorginho Rosenstrike. What Rosenstrike three, Lewis four. Oh, okay, so that's disrespectful, I think, but that's all right. Well, all of these guys have fights um, scheduled. Literally well, Rosen, Rosenstrick fights Lewis. Who is Blades fight? No, Blades oh no, fights Blades Lewis. fights Rosenstrick. Rosenstrick has a fight scheduled with Gane. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. How what is, is that? What is Gane at seven? I think Eight? seven. I want to say seven. Damn. So I guess Volkov's just sitting and waiting. He's just waiting. But all right. So yes, facts. That's kind of not debatable. But what is debatable is. Who's he waiting on? Volk, I don't think Volkov's in the Sanhagen seat. I don't think he's what. I, I oh no, he, he has to fight at least one more time, at least. Thank Maybe you, two. Volkov, Maybe two. After the fight, I don't know if you heard. He was like, "Oh no, title shot next, title shot next." Like, nah, dog. Especially whenever 
What two of the guys ahead of him have beat him? Right? He lost Derek, to Lewis oh, and Blades. Derek Lewis was tweeting about that. He was like, "Hey, bro, come on!" Like he was like, "I hear what you're saying, but fuck you." Because he lost the Blades <laughs> too, right? So he lost yeah. the two guys ahead of him, and he said he should skip him for a title. Like, and his two wins, no. and his two wins are Walt Harris and Alistair Overeem. Like, come on, bro! Like you need to get. You, he needs one of those names we just read off. He needs one, one of those of names we just read off. Yeah, I, I want to say Blades Lewis are fighting the soonest out of all those. That sounds right. That's going to be a good one, man. If so, if, I mean, if Derek I, Lewis I is serious I'm about – because Derek Lewis has been saying he's working on his wrestling, like a whole bunch. He apparently flew out a coach out there. Uh, he's in way better shape. I'm interested to see what the new Derek Lewis looks like, if that's all true. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's also fun. I think. I think just because of timing. I think. I mean, Volkov fights the winner of Lewis Blades, right? Because he's lost to both of those guys. So yeah. regardless of who wins, it's a rematch. It's sellable. I mean, it's at the bare minimum a fight night main card. Um, you know what I mean? It's it, it's sellable. It's marketable. It makes sense in the rankings. I mean, there's not, not really. I think I think that's the move. I think you give him the winner of Lewis Blade. I yeah. do have I do have an interesting proposition here for you. Okay, okay. Stipe Ngannou is signed and coming up. Yes. Volkov could get the loser. Also not bad. Also Stipe, not bad. Because I personally I think Ngannou starches Stipe this time. So I'm going to say that Stipe Volkov is a fun matchup. It is. That see that begs a very interesting question. What does more for Volkov, Stipe coming off a loss, or like if Blades the rematch of a Lewis, guy that yeah that's true. If he avenges Blades, you beat. But see, I mean, you don't know the real elephant in the room slash rat on the table. I mean, maybe this is my prediction. I think Volkov is the fifth best fighter in the division. Yeah, I agree. No, I agree with that entirely I don't think because, he like, wins any of the fights we just threw out there. No, and honestly, I think Gane might be better than Volkov. To be quite honest with you, you, you know, the only guy that I think I might like Volkov against is if is if Rosenstroy Rosen beats Gane. Yeah, I think Volkov matches well against Rosenstrike, and then if he could beat Rosenstrike after a Gane win, I think that does position him for a title shot. But that's so many ifs. Like that's yeah. it's not just ifs. It's ifs. I think won't happen. Like I, I like Gane over Rosenstreich, and I and, and so yeah. Or I mean, honestly, even if Gane wins, see if Gane beats Rosenstreich and Volkov takes that fight, it kind of makes it seem like he's taking the easiest fight, does it not? Let me ask you this: Do you think any of these guys beat Ngannou if Ngannou holds the strap? Yeah. Well. Uh, can I now if you say will, no, no, I mean, like, uh, like, 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 you would predict that if these guys fought, that Ngani would lose that fight. I think Blades presents the best shot, but I he's lost if, twice by KO twice to Ngani. Facts, facts, but the wrestling Blades presents, I feel like, presents the best matchup. Like, if, if, if Blades and say, what if, what if Blades knocks out Lewis? Oh, you know god, that'd be crazy. I, you know what's you know what's crazy to think about, man, is think about this. Nganu KO'd Rosenstreich in nine seconds. He has that the shittiest fight of all time against Lewis, right? That we all hate. But he has two KO victories against Blades, both first round KOs. He has a KO victory against um uh JDS. Like, dude, Nganu's KO streak is just nuts. Nuts. So, th- this is what makes heavyweight like, if this was any other division, it would make it easier to break down. But the one punch thing in heavyweights makes it almost next to impossible to predict, especially when one of those one punches is in Ghana. Like right, right. So, like, like, what's crazy to me is, like, we, like, a few months ago, we were all in agreement that Stipe was the GOAT heavyweight. But now it's like, do I want to bet money that he beats Ngannou again? I'm not putting my money on that. I'm never putting my money. In fact, I'll put a lot of money on Ngannou. I'm, I'm pretty sure just seeing how Stipe has, like, come well, along through the, the D.C. Ngannou hasn't fought in fucking forever. Before he fought more recently than uh, Stipe, though, did he not? No, I guess Stipe no, fought Stipe against Stipe D.C. 
Yeah, yeah. And, but it's like, but think about this, man. Stipe has fought once a year for the last four years, and he's 38. He's had four fights since he was 34. That's not good. That's not good. The, the, the only thing I'll say about Ngannou, and it's the definition of easier said than done, is like if somebody is able to like you know like wrestle him and keep top position, I mean it's not like he has a dope like bottom game or like you know. It, no, it's and in fact it's terrible. Like that's how yeah, Stipe so just that's mauled what the I'm shit saying. out. Like the, there's a clear path to victory against Ngannou. It's just the definition of easier said than done. But think about this: Stipe Ngannou was three and a half years ago, essentially, and like. Ngannou hasn't been taken down like that since, or held down like that since. So does that yeah. mean that he does that mean that he made that weakness strong enough to where you can't use that against him anymore? And if I, that's I, the case, that's who can the touch ultimate, that man? That's the ultimate question. Because if I mean, if 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 Ngannou like is untakedownable, I know that's forgive me, my former English teachers, but like <laughs> if, if, if Ngannou proves to where he can stuff takedowns like consistently, then I think he runs the division for quite some time. I mean, me too. Me too. Because the young up and comer in the wings is Gane, and he's not like a grappler, really. Gane, Romanov, the the huge uh, King Kong, that dude. He's an yeah. all grappler, but I think, but like we're talking about, oh, a punch from Ngannou is is from out. That's an outer space meteorite. Like you, you can't take it. No one can take it yet. Yeah, it, it's the old like I said. It makes this next to impossible to predict because like. Just, I mean, just saying, like, like, say, so Rosenstroik's behind Ghana right now. So if, if Rosenstroik beats Ghana, he technically has the next claim to the title shot, right? I mean, if you're being rankings McGee about it. And. Well, I guess Blades would if Blades won, right? Oh, you're right. But yeah. it sucks because both those guys have inside 90 second KO losses to Ngannou, and Blades has two of them. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, man. Fuck, I'm... It's almost like, does does Lewis have the best chance of knocking out Ngannou just on he has He team? has a win. He has a win against Ngannou. That's what I'm saying. Like, is Lewis... Even though Lewis is the lowest rank of the heavyweights we mentioned, like, does Lewis present the most problems moving forward? I mean, he's not necessarily a young man himself, but... He presents the most problems for Ngannou because he can match his power almost, and yes. he has pretty good striking defense. And better wrestling. Correct. Yeah, I feel you. It, Lewis, Lewis, seeing the Lewis Blades is going to be such a sick fight. Yeah, so I, I have it right now. Lewis Blades fights uh, the 20. It's coming up in, what, two weeks? Yeah, two weeks. They headline the card. And then the very next week is um, Rosenstruck Gane. Dude, and then Stipe and Nganu is a month like past a few that. weeks after that. Let's go. Heavyweight's about to heat up. So that's the cool thing about this is, like, we can speculate. We can kind of conjecture. But this is all going to play out in real time over oh. like the next, like, You know what we days. didn't just talk about at all? Who? There's a little guy named John Jones waiting for the next heavyweight champion. <laughs> yeah right i mean yeah. talking about x factor I yeah mean, you just got the dark any, horse waiting in the in the wings are any of the names we just mentioned a uh, favorite over john being the fact that it's his first time in the division you don't think that vegas might kind of lean again like factor in that it's his first fight in the division have you seen him lately have you seen what he looks like <laughs> yeah Oh, dude, he looks, like, he looks like Chandler Jones. Like, I don't know who's betting against a man that physically freaky with that amount of fight, like, IQ. Wow. So, so I mean, I, I guess this is the last and final question I'll leave you with. And I'll <laughs> it, it, does John jump straight to title shot, or does he oh, have to Michael Chandler? I hate, I hate the jump straight to title shot, but... They did it for Izzy. They have to do it for John. If you're going to do it for Izzy, you have to do it for John. The, the, the only thing I could see is, like, say Ngannou beats Stipe, 
John Stipe is easily marketable, but will Stipe be ready? Like, we can't wait a year. You know what I'm saying? Or or will Stipe take a non-title fight? Like, if Stipe loses, is he going to be like, I deserve a rematch, blah, 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 blah. I'm Stipe. I'm, get, I'm getting kind of sick of Stipe acting that way. He's getting okay. a little too precipitous on that hill. Okay, very valid points. And then, I mean, honestly, I'll be real. John versus anybody besides Stipe or Ngannou – doesn't do much for me. I mean, Blaze is a hell of a wrestler, but Jones has the jujitsu. And I mean, I don't, Lewis's big bombs, I mean, that's just not sophisticated enough to beat a guy like Jones, in my opinion. I mean, you I know, know he has the wrestling too. The best part of all this is just like you just said, because I didn't realize it until you brought it up. We're going to get a lot of our answers in two months. This is almost like the lightweight tournament. Yeah. Like this, this is yeah. so. It's these are so much fun. Whenever you get like a top six where everyone's kind of interchangeable pieces, it's so much fun. Oh, it's the best, man! And then, then just the word heavyweight just magnifies everything. Like of regardless course. of how you feel, yeah, it's, it's the baddest just, man on yeah, the planet sure. title, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. But man, what a fucking fun episode! What a great night of fights last night. Episode thirty-four is going to go down as one of my favorites. I hope it's one of the viewers' favorites. I totally I, I, agree, man. Straight up, bro, as far as, like, I don't know. I had an absolute blast talking with you about these fights. They were fun fights to talk about. And so much fun, like, prediction for the future, too. Uh, the, the projection of the divisions was made so great by last night's fights. Yeah, yeah, man, for sure. Um, yeah, love it. Love BP Nation. Um, this is episode 34 of BP Boys Breakdown. Please go subscribe on YouTube. My BP Boys is falling behind my dreadful talk. I wanted to catch up. MMA yeah, yeah, fans, yeah. UFC fans. Fucking go subscribe on YouTube to Beefy Boys Breakdown. We break them down into clips that only go to YouTube. Um, those aren't True. an audio platform, so that's another incentive to subscribe on YouTube. And, um, yeah, or if you are an audio podcast person, feel free. We're on all – wherever you find your audio podcast, check out Beefy Boys Breakdown. But, yeah, thanks so much, man. We're back in the swing of things. Looks like we're going weekly again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll see you next Sunday. Oh, uh, yeah, brother. Have a good one. You too.